Sergeant Arms, if, uh, just let me know when we're ready to roll. Let me know when we're good. We can tapes rolling, all the good stuff. Ready to go. All right. All right. Good morning. I am Costa Constantinidis, chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Councilmember Adrian Adams. Uh, and today we'll be holding an oversight hearing on the challenge in managing the Department of Environmental Protection wastewater infrastructure. During the early warning hours of Saturday, November 30th, a blockage in a sewage line at 150th Street near Kenny Airport caused raw sewage to back up into basements in South Ozone Park and South Jamaica resident neighborhoods. The blockage affected an area of approximately 40 square blocks bounded by Baisley Pond uh, Park and Van Wyck Expressway to the east and west and Rockaway Boulevard and the Belt Parkway to north and south. The severity of the flooding ranged from a few inches of raw sewage to several feet and some homes. Residents were informed by DEP officials that their potable water supply was not contaminated by the backup, but were asked to curtail water usage until the blockage could be bypassed in order to avoid further compounding flooding already exasperated by heavy rains on Sunday, December 1st. The residents were also asked to turn off their heat, hot water, and electricity while the problem was addressed. A temporary above ground bypass system was completed on December 1st was expected to prevent further backup issues while the affected sewer line located 40 feet below ground is repaired. As of Monday, December 9th, the cause of the blockup had not yet to be determined, but a blockage caused by grease or potential collapse had been suggested as causes. Untreated sewer, sewage contains bacteria, viruses, organic matter, parasites, toxins, and metals, all which, all which may cause illnesses when humans come in contact with them and require costly cleanups. Sensitive populations, including children and the elderly and those with weakened, weakened immune systems, can be at higher risk for illness from exposure to sewage. Many of the department's sewer backups have been found to reoccur at the same location within the same year. The ongoing occurrence of thousands of backups per year, including repeat backups at the same location, indicates inadequate operation and maintenance. Southeast Queens lies in, uh, largely in areas where the water table is shallow, less than 11 feet below the surface, and where potential substructure flooding may occur, and many structures were developed without infrastructure in place. While the department is replacing a number of sewer segments, that work is not completed, and as an interim clogged sewer line or broken pipe may be the rule rather than the exception. Uh, the department has a, prot a protocol to follow with respect to broken and sewer lines that protect the community and form the correct parties and ensure the community that's not going to be blamed when DEP infrastructure fails. While DEP works to address this issue, steps will, should be taken to assure that residents are not burdened with debris and sewage from failure to properly maintain wastewater infrastructure. Actions need to be taken to protect, protect residents from the potential negative health effects associated with the damage of this incident. We have to do better. At a time of year when families are supposed to be home, together celebrating the Thanksgiving weekend, they were sleeping in their cars. People lost their treasured memories while they sludged through sewage and exposed themselves to harmful toxins. To add insult to injury, the blame was initially placed on them with the allegation that's all too often assumed that grease cored down the drain and mass. That's not how we should be responding to a crisis. I look forward to hearing from DEP and from the residents to really ascertain what happened here, how it can be prevented in the future, and how we make these families whole once again. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Adrian Adams, whose community was impacted, and I want to thank her for her strong leadership and fighting for her neighborhood. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, and I would like to thank you all for attending today's hearing. I want to thank 
Councilmember Costa Constantinides for holding this very important oversight hearing. On Saturday, November 30th, just after the Thanksgiving holiday, residents of South Ozone Park in South Jamaica woke up to a nightmare. They encountered foul smells and sewage flooding their homes. Much to their horror, these residents were forced to wade through sewage in an effort to try to save their precious belongings. From approximately 1 a.m. to 1 p.m., desperate calls for help from numerous residents went out to 311, which were summarily ignored. At approximately 1.40 p.m., a call from the president of the 149th Street Civic Association was made to my office to alert us of this emergency, and my chief of staff immediately headed over to the affected site. At that time, it was noted that several city agencies were there, including the NYPD, FDNY, and Con Edison. From all indications, the assumption was that DEP was on the way. At approximately 3 p.m., I personally made a call to our Director of Community Affairs at DEP to inform her of this critical situation and to inquire of DEP's whereabouts. She informed me that she was not aware of the situation, but would call operations immediately. Subsequently, many residents reported that the DEP was slow to mobilize on the scene. After over 10 hours of the first reported complaint, the question remained, where was DEP? Finally, at some point during the evening, the Department of Environmental Protection appeared in the neighborhood and began to visit affected homes. That night, some residents slept in cars, and many continued to stay in hotels to this very day. At a time when families should be excited to decorate for the Christmas holiday, my constituents are enduring the stress of not knowing when they will be back in their homes. In the aftermath of this sewage backup, many families in my community have missed work and missed school. Some are concerned about black mold in their homes, and others don't know where to start because they don't have the means to begin repairs or replace furniture out of pocket. As the former chairperson of Community Board 12 Queens, I can tell you that for the past decade, nearly every district needs statement cited inadequate sewers. So I ask the administration today, is it time to create a proactive plan to keep the infrastructure protected? Is it time to install an adequate system to sustain the needs of the community? Do we need another sewage backup of this magnitude to make the case? I hope to understand what went wrong, and I'm looking for a commitment that the administration will have a proactive response by making any adjustments necessary to ensure that this never happens again. We can and must do better as a city to protect our residents. My constituents are taxpayers who pay some of the highest taxes in this entire city. They certainly didn't deserve a sewage disaster. They certainly didn't deserve to be stigmatized by an unsubstantiated premature narrative pertaining to the disposal of cooking grease on Thanksgiving Day. They certainly didn't deserve to be publicly shamed in the midst of tragedy, a tragedy they did not create. I truly appreciate all of the hard work and commitment by the administration to repair this situation, and I am grateful for all of the dedicated agencies who have pitched in 24 by 7 for the past week and a half and are in it with us for the long haul to assist my constituents in their time of need. DEP, NYCEM, DSNY, NYPD, FDNY, DOHMH, and the Red Cross. Your help has been immeasurable. Thank you. I'm also anxious 
to hear answers to our questions and thoughtful testimony from our residents. Thank you all for being here once again, because New Yorkers should never have to go through anything like this again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Uh, so just to give a little bit of housekeeping, we're gonna have a panel of residents, then we're gonna have the DEP commissioner and their team come up and testify, and then we're gonna have another panel, panel subsequent to that. So um, just wanna call up the first panel, Kahari White, uh, Laron Harmon, Ian Kendall, and Bina Balgobin. I know somebody, I'm with a name like Constantinus, I always do my best to try to get it right. But if you can all step forward to testify. If you haven't heard your name called, uh, you will be called after the DEP panel. And if you do want to testify, and you have not filled out one of these cards yet, you need to do so right here at the desk. So please uh, fill out a card if you're interested in testifying so we can call you and have your voice be heard. Thank you. Good afternoon, well, good morning. Um, thank you for your testimony here today. Sir, if you could begin here on, on my left. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Good morning. My name is uh, Ian Kendall. I reside at 13018, 146 Street. <clears throat> I was on vacation when the flood occurred and I received a call from my neighbor to explain to me what happened. One of my relatives entered the home to discover we were lucky to the point that we had just about three inches of sewage, but it was sewage. So everything in my basement basically of wood was damaged. <clears throat> there was good response from the city agencies in terms of the cleanup and restoration. Restoration is a big problem. We do not, as of yet, know if they're gonna repair our basements. Our basements were whole before this incident. We are being told by the DEP commissioner that we have to wait until an investigation to decide who is gonna fix our basements. I don't think that's our problem. They're an agency, if even when they identify whoever's a problem, they can deal with them. Our homes were whole and clean before November 30th at 1 a.m. We need to have restitution and repairs to our basements now. Now, <clears throat> prior to this, over the last five years, my basement, my uh, sewer system, I have to clean it twice a year, all right? I call the guys and they come and they tell me that there's nothing wrong, they open up the trap and they say there's nothing wrong. Two or three days after, you hear the bubbling coming up in the bathroom, in the, in the basement, or in the toilet bowls. So to me, this seems to be an existing problem prior to this matter. There have been a lot of construction of hotels in our neighborhood. I mean, ex a tremendous amount of hotels have been built in our neighborhood. And I have not seen any major <coughs> DAP projects in our neighborhood to compensate for this issue. So DP needs to show us if they did any additional work to accommodate all these hotels that they've allowed to be built in the neighborhood you know, within a three mile, a three mile radius. Uh, <clears throat> Basically, that's my main thing. I need to know about construction, reconstruction for our basements. And basically, that's my main concerns amongst us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. Sir. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Make sure your microphone's on. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Environmental Protection Committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address the committee about the Queen's sewage backup in South Ozone Park and how it has impacted the residents in the area. 
My name is Kyrie White, and I'm the president of the 149th Street South Ozone Park Civic Association. This association has been around for over 30 years. Uh, on November 30th of uh, uh, 2019, I was driving, and I was headed to St. Paul's Church. St. Paul's Church is where we have for our monthly civic meetings. Uh, while heading there around approximately around 12 p.m., I received a phone call from one of my uh, members, Dale Lynch. Mrs. Lynch advised me that in the immediate area, there was, a, uh, there was several complaints of sewage in the area. More than about 20 neighbors on Inwood Street complained about this. Uh, she also advised me that they had called 311 since 1 o'clock and nobody has uh, responded. Uh, furthermore, I decided to park my car and take a walk down Inwood myself and just investigate the issues. And there and behold, I seen many, uh, 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 many of the uh, neighbors on the corner complaining about this issue. One in particular neighbor that I know of, Neil, he invited me into his home and said, come and check out the basement. I followed him and, and in his basement I seen there was nothing but sludge and remnants of sewage. What had happened was he had uh, probably had, um, he said earlier it was about three feet of sewage, but due to his pumping, his own pump, he used his own pump that he brought from the store to pump out the sewage. Uh, furthermore, although there was, le there was uh, little remnants of sewage, you can see that many of his belongings in the basement was damaged. His couch was soiled with, uh, with sewage, along with many items that, was, that were damaged because of the, um, the sewage and so forth. F uh, after that, after t uh, taking note of that, I decided to give uh, Ms. Adams' office a call. I called the office and advised them of the situation at hand. After alerting them that, I continued back to St. Paul's Church to attend our monthly meeting. But this time I decided to change the meeting. I made an emergency meeting. I wanted to alert the members that were coming there that there is an issue regarding the sewage. So we waited and I also uh, um, called a few elected officials as well to attend this meeting. We waited to about maybe, let's say roughly around three o'clock. Uh, three o'clock we got together and we spoke as a community on what we should do in terms of uh, this situation. How could we help the situation and help the, uh, our neighbors? Again, around three o'clock, Ms. Dale, she called me once again and asked if I was coming down. I said I'd be on our way. Around 3.10, 3.15, we, we headed down to Inwood Street. Went down, I went down Inwood Street and I went to one of my civic members, Mr. Pinchbacker, and he asked, his son asked me to go down to his basement. When I walked down his basement, I, lo and behold, I was in utter disbelief. It was almost as if I was in a horror movie. The basement was filled to about four feet of raw sewage. When you walked down the stairs, the bottom rung was invisible, so you couldn't see it. It was unable, to, you weren't able to pass down, go any further. To also to tell you that it was for four feet, I can tell you because I took a stick and I actually placed it inside the sewage and I marked it. Uh, so I knew for a fact that it was over four feet and not in just one area, but the entire basement. Everything he had was really pretty much destroyed. Beds was floating, uh, clothing was floating, items was floating, all on top of the sewage. Furthermore, um, I decided to take another walk and look at other uh, homes that, uh, that had the same uh, situation regarding the sewage. One lady's house I refused to go into was so contaminated because she was uh, pumping the sewage out through the front, front yard of her door through a two inch uh, hose. It was pumping out like a geyser. Uh, I didn't want to walk in because I didn't want to step near the sewage I mean, and, and um, near her thresh, uh, threshold. The sewage was everywhere. I, I didn't want to contaminate my clothing or my, uh, my shoes. Furthermore, uh, another instance is where, um, um, let's see. Another, another, uh, another young lady on 133rd Avenue, uh, her, her basin was literally submerged in over three feet of water. The lady continuously pumped out the water, but she, she claimed and she cried and said the water is not going anywhere. It was to believe that the water was being circulated back into her home. Uh, in addition to this, uh, this is all around 345, 4.30 uh, during this time frame. I remember that day clearly because it was very cold that day. And what I noticed that everybody was, the neighbors were staying outside. They were outside because the stench was so unbearable. I mean, the rancid sewage was just so unbearable and it was so intolerable that people, they opted to 
to stand and wait outside or in their cars as opposed to being inside their own homes, risking the, fire, risking, uh, um, risking the fact that they may get sick from the cold weather. Furthermore, around 4.45, I met, with, I met Deputy Commissioner and he briefly, uh, he briefed the residents that DEP employees would individually pump out the homes affected by the sewage. I later saw the DEP crews setting up pumps in the neighborhood around 5.30, 6 p.m. Um, that's all of this matter, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, make sure make sure you hit your, your you put on your microphone or we'll make sure we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. Yeah, my name is Bina Balgobin. I live <coughs> by 146th Street under North Conduit, 145-45 North Conduit. On November 38, 30th, a friend of mine called and asked uh, like around eight o'clock if I have any flood in my basement. I said no because there was no flood. But before like 8, 10, I went downstairs to check it out. I saw some water sipping out. But then when I turned around, like two, three minutes, I called my son because he does HVAC and he has pumps. So I asked him to get his pump ready because people say their basement are flooding. Before I finished talking to him, I see the water start coming up the sewage like a tsunami. I called 311. They're telling me like, uh, they will be here between six and seven hours. After the basement got flooded, like almost a foot of water and sewage, I called them again. They said, well, I called already. I have to wait for them to come, which was like another, they said maybe late, uh, more than six or seven hours. By then, the whole basement was, was almost flooded, three to four, three feet, two to three feet of water, even though I had the pumps and whatever. And then when we first started to pump, uh, to pump the water out or the sewage, we were so confused. It was, uh, they lead it outside and it went into the yard. The whole yard is like, until this day, you cannot walk in the yard because it's all sewage there. Toilet tissue crumpled all over the, the yard. And now I, like they say it all, whatever happened. But for me, I am retired. I live on a, a budget, and they are saying they're not gonna rebuild. I want to know where am I gonna get these funds to rebuild because I, when the money comes, the money I have is just, in, it's not enough to pay my bills. Sometimes I don't have any remaining to buy food because I get just a little bit above that amount of money you're supposed to get from my pension and my social security. They don't give me no food stamp or anything. So sometimes I go, like for this past couple of days, we cannot cook in the house or do anything in the house. So we were like having one meal per day and I don't know how long this is gonna be and how am I gonna rebuild. Good morning all. My name is Laron Harmon. I live on 130, that's 36 Inwood Street. Uh, I'm one of those individuals who been affected since 2.30 a.m., 11.30. I was one that called, uh, I was woken up by my daughter who was visiting from college. I said, Dad, I smell something funny. So I proceeded to go downstairs. To, I said, well, maybe it's the trap. Just like the gentleman said, I usually have to do my trap twice a year because it's always been a flooding issue, a sewage issue. If I, don't, if I forget not to do it, nine times out of 10, I, have to, I would have a, a situation. Either way, my daughter called me, she said, Dad, I smell something funny, I ran downstairs. I said, okay, well maybe I need to snake this out myself. Lo and behold, the worst thing I could have ever done was remove that cap. Because when I moved that cap off the, the line, it came out like a water hose. I had to, get everybody up as quick as possible because my basement was a furnished basement. All my clothing was in this basement. My son's clothing, my daughter had clothes in the washing machine. I have a 10-year-old son, all his toys, his bike, 
everything is in the basement. So we hustling to get everything upstairs as quick as possible. In the intro, my wife is calling 311, the fire department, 311, the fire department, 311, no answer. Everybody's saying, oh, call this person, call that person, call it. This went on till nine o'clock in the morning. At 9 a.m. in the morning, I had close to four and a half feet of sewage in my basement. Washing machines, dryer, the heating, the furnace, the hot water tank, that went immediately. That happened at, that went by at least seven o'clock a.m. in the morning. So now I have no height water, I have no heat in the house. I'm one of those families that had to sleep in that car, in that driveway, with my children, because I didn't have no means at the time to place anybody. The next day, we end up getting a hotel. I'm still in this hotel now for going on three weeks. Three weeks. I still don't have no heat. I still don't have no hot water. I've been there for three decades. I've never seen nothing like this before, ever. And to still be living in a hotel, exhausting all my funds, my personal funds, it, this is just unacceptable. Unacceptable. Something needs to be done. I need to move back into my house. I need some heat, I need hot water. I was told that they cleaned out the basement but I had to be proactive myself. Every day I'm going down there with bleach and a spray can, spraying everything down, because the smell is still in the house, even after they said they cleaned it. It's still in the house. I have forced heat, meaning that I have vents in all the rooms and in all the floors. So the smell from the sewage went through each and every room. Yeah. Second floor, first floor, whereas that I had to throw out all the mattresses in my house. I had cloth, furniture, I had to throw my whole living room set out. This is this this has been really tough. I haven't been to work in two weeks. Because they said that somebody need to be there all day long because periodically people is coming in, checking in and out. I have to go back to work. I need to get back to work. But before I get back to work, I need heat and hot water in my home so I could place my family there and we could be safe. My wife has concerns with the smell. I have a 10 year old son once again. He's very, uh, he's allergic to everything. <laughs> so I don't know how long, what kind of long lasting effects this has on us, on the children. This is, this was a disaster and we need the answers. I'm a taxpayer. I live in a very good neighborhood, hardworking people. We deserve better than this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tarman. Thank you all. Uh, I, I have questions as well. I mean, so has the DEP explained and gone through the reimbursement process with you, um, how this is going to work? Um, has anyone from the, from the mayor's office been out and explained to you how you're able to be made whole? In my case, no. no. I just was told that they was gonna do the cleanup. I was told that the restoration is gonna be on myself. Our own responsibility. And um, no, where is the mayor? I, I was told that he was supposed to be the, uh, representing uh, or coming through to speak to us on several occasions. I mean, he had representatives, but I was so eager to speak to him myself. The rest of the families, Mr. Mr. Kendall or Ms. The, um, the controls office has instructed us to file claims with them uh, for personal belongings. And we have to do that within 90 days. Okay. Uh, as per regards our restoration of our basement and repairs, we are not getting any answers where that is concerned. Yeah. So they say five for 90 days, and they may accept estimates if you get estimates for a repairing of your basement. They may accept it, so that's where we stand right now. And has anyone explained to you all how to document the damage to your home in order to be eligible for any? They told business? us to take pictures. Take pictures. And pictures. if you can write whatever you can write, if you have any old bills, you can submit them if you happen to have them and submit the pictures that you took of the things that you had to discard. 
So basically, that's where we're at. Has any, has, th it sounds like there's been issues before. We, you, you know, several of you talked about having to clean your lines twice a year in order to prevent. Has there been challenges in the community but prior to this? Uh, I, prior to this, we, I, most of us in the neighborhood have sub pumps. I didn't know that most of my neighbors says I have. I mean, I had one myself. I had to purchase one that morning. But I realized most of the people on that block has a sub pump in their home. I, at first, when I bought the house, I was like, oh, OK, well. But I realized shortly after why we have sub pumps in that area. Because once again, at least twice a year, there's a, some sort of flood. Not to this degree, but there's always a, some sort of issue that needs to be addressed. I, uh, <clears throat> like I said, I do my basement twice a year. Now, one time I called the EP because the, the plumber said to me, I don't have a problem in, this, in my home, it's in the street. They came <clears throat> and they lifted up the, the sewer and the guy rang my bell and says, I don't have a problem in the street. It has to be inside. I says, my plumber just told me it's not in the house, it's in the street. So you guys need to find out what's going on. This is happening way too often. And I never heard from them again. And then subsequently, a year after, I had the same problem again. Yeah. So it seems to be an ongoing problem in the neighborhood, in a three mile radius. Mm. Yeah, and they need to check it out. Mr. White. Yes, can I also add, um, as a president of the Civic Association, many of my members have, uh, since two, uh, we can date back, and it's on record for 2000, I think, 11, where they have made complaints regarding the, uh, the water table in that media area, uh, flooding. Uh, I don't, don't quote, um, on Inwood Street and uh, 133rd and Inwood Street, and between Inwood and 133rd and 138th Avenue, many of the members have complained, and not only complained, they have actually set out uh, work orders for DEP to, to investigate regarding the flooding in that immediate area. So that's prior to this uh, sewage flood that's taking place. Thank you. With that, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Adrian Adams, for questions, uh, and I'll be back in a moment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, thank you all for being here today. We've seen each other a lot over the past couple of weeks, and it um, has not been a happy situation for any of us. So as we continue to go through um, this really, really tough situation. Um, I, I, I just want to say that your, your strength and tenacity is notable. Um, and I just want to, first of all, thank you all for your strength um, in the face of a situation that none of us would have ever imagined would have been going on. Um, when it comes to your being made whole, I just want to visit that a little bit more, if you don't mind, because we know that in our community meetings over the past couple of weeks, we've, we've had uh, representation from the Comptroller's office, and he was invited to be here today, and he is not here uh, for us to ask this question to, so I will ask you, as far as your experience has been with responsiveness, number one, uh, in understanding reimbursement, and number two, your feelings about the procedure in the future as it's been explained to you by the Comptroller's Office and the forms involved. Well, <clears throat> there seems to be some kind of ambiguity on behalf of the Comptroller's Office because they said that there is no guarantee that you will be reimbursed for your claims. So we like hanging in the air. We don't know what is going to happen. So that's part of my, of my issue with them. Although they say they, they file the claim, then comes back with there's no guarantee you will be reimbursed. You know. Anybody else have anything to add to that? I don't know because I know they said it's our responsibility to do all that repairs and rebuilding, but why should it be our responsibility when it's not our fault that our basement got messed up? I'm just surprised at the controller's office, period. When we went to the emergency uh, help center, they had no clue. It wasn't there for the first 
four days, I would say, four to five days. And then when he did get there, I remember specifically the man uh, held out a form and he said, well, all I can tell you to do is uh, fill out this form, everything that you know you think that you lost, and I'm be only giving you 90 days after, as of this day to get it done. After that, you're cut off. Yeah. That's the one thing that I do remember him saying. And once again, like I said, I had a fully furnished basement. I be honest with you, there's so much stuff I lost, I can't even count. I, I can't itemize all the things at all, at all. We're talking about 20 years of memories. <laughs> Some things I can't, there's no price to put on that. So um, to be told, yeah, 90 days, and uh, we're not exactly sure if we're gonna take care of all your items. Um, like the, Oh, the, the young man sat here next to me. We are in limbo. We, have, we are really in a cloud, not knowing what our future beholds. In regards to construction, uh, getting back assets, uh, our livelihoods. So that's it, I don't know. Thank you for oh. that. Uh, Kyrie, did you? Yeah, I should say a little. Uh, just from canvassing the area and speaking with m the many victims in that immediate area, what seems to be the main concern regarding insurance uh, is that uh, reimbursement. A lot of people cannot front the cash up, up forward. Uh, a lot of people do not have $8,000, $5,000 in their accounts in order to get the work done and to wait on who's at fault before they can issue a reimbursement. That seems one of the main issues in the immediate area, uh, just from speaking with the residents there. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. That's why I wanted to get this on the table because I knew that the controller would not be here today and uh, his representative has chosen not to testify. I wanted to get the financial burden out there as a part of your testimony because we need to have on record the impact and the severity of the financial burden on the residents that have been affected by this disaster. So we know that there are forms to fill out we know that you've been given 90 days per the comptroller for the forms to have the paperwork, your documentation, your pictures, everything else handed in or else you go back to square one and have to start the process all over again or not. I don't even know that because that's a question of mine that I can't get answered today. The other thing is that the word ambiguity is 100% on point. We needed answers to number one, what exactly is covered by the city, what is covered by the Comptroller's Office when it comes to a disaster like this? What will be covered? Is there a cap on the amount of money, the reimbursement in a situation like this? I mean, my questions in, in just off the top of my head go on and on and on, and the fact that we cannot get the answers to those questions here today by the uh, responsible office is very disheartening to me, but I thank you all for your testimony. We will continue to work with you on a daily basis, hour by hour, minute by minute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. And thank you all for your testimony. I mean, we are, I'm deeply sorry for all that you're going through, and we look forward to getting the answers that you all deserve. All right. Thank you, Chairman. With that, I'll call forward uh, DEP and, and the New York City Administration, if you can all step forward. If you, uh, Jeff Hunter, uh, Commissioner Deanne Criswell, uh, Vincent Sapienza, DEP Commissioner, uh, Christine, oh wait, no, Christine, that she's from a different panel. Uh, and Michael Deloche, are you testifying, Mike? Okay, great, all right. So I need to have my attorney give her a moment to come back and she has to swear you in. Samara, I need you to swear in the witnesses. Thank you. How, let everyone know we've been joined by, I know Councilmember Perkins who was here a few minutes ago and Councilmember Menchaca from Brooklyn as well. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth today? I do. Commissioner. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Constantinidis and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Thank you for inviting us here today to discuss challenges in managing the Department of Environmental Protection 
wastewater infrastructure. I'm joined here at the table today by Deanne Criswell, the Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. Um, Jeff Hunter is here. He's the Assistant Commissioner uh, at, at DOHMH for the Division of Environmental Health and members of the team to help us answer questions. DEP operates and maintains the city's vast water and wastewater infrastructure from dams and reservoirs located more than 100 miles from the city to the 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities spread throughout the five boroughs. The distribution and collection system includes the longest continuous tunnel in the world and more than 7,500 miles of sewers, equivalent to a pipe stretching from City Hall to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and back. I'm glad to be here to discuss this important topic, particularly in light of the sewage backup that caused so much damage in Southeast Queens just over a week ago. Homeowners, their families, and their tenants impact, impacted by that blockage have endured a real calamity, and we are sorry for the tremendous disruption, especially during the holiday weekend. My staff and our agency colleagues have been working around the clock since the morning of November 30th to ensure the following, that we connect with homeowners to identify and address critical needs, identify and address the cause of the sewer blockage located deep beneath the 150th Street overpass abutment, install and maintain multiple bypass pumps to move wastewater around the blockage, pump out flooded basements, clean impacted homes, provide air quality monitoring throughout the neighborhood, wash down streets and clear debris, and install new boilers and new hot water heaters for those that have been out without heat and hot water. This work will not stop until the job is done. I want to speak now about our sewer infrastructure maintenance. During the de Blasio administration, significant additional DEP resources have been authorized for inspecting and cleaning sewers and drainage infrastructure. As reported in the annual Mayor's Management Report, sewer blockages have dropped considerably by 48% between FY13 and FY19. On an average day, we physically inspect more than 9,000 feet of sewers. More than 600 miles of sewer were cleaned of debris in 2018. More than two-thirds of this was proactive maintenance cleaning. Data about sewer maintenance are presented in DEP's annual State of the Sewers Report, which is posted on our website, and additional information is provided annually to the City Council regarding maintenance of sewer catch basins. I know that questions have been raised about the age of the City's water and sewer infrastructure, and so I'd like to address those concerns. As is well documented in the industry, age alone is not a good indicator of replacement requirements. Materials composition, subsurface conditions, construction techniques, and traffic all impact longevity. DEP engineers use a sophisticated asset management tool to determine when water and sewer pipes need replacement. We typically allocate $1 billion each year in our capital improvement plan for pipe replacement and upgrades. We are always mindful that this funding comes almost exclusively from property owners who pay a water bill. So we must be efficient in our daily work and use analytics for our capital planning. Uh, now about the sewage backup in Queens. Uh, as everyone here is aware, during the weekend of November 30th to December 1st, a large sewer became partially blocked in Southeast Queens. These types of backups are very rare which is indicative of how diligently DEP crews maintain the 7,500 miles of sewer infrastructure, 95 sewage pumping stations, and 14 wastewater treatment plants that handle 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater on a dry weather day and up to 3.8 billion gallons when it rains. I know that there are many questions about how the events unfolded on Saturday and how the city has responded, and so I'd like to take a few minutes to provide a rundown of everything that happened. Between 3.30 a.m. and 6 a.m., seven calls were made to 311 by residents in Southeast Queens reporting sewage backing up into their basements or cellars. At 7.55 a.m., a DEP crew in a flusher degreaser truck arrived at 146th Street and Sutter Avenue. They worked for about an hour to clear that pipe. By 10 a.m., a total of 12 calls were received by 311, and DEP supervisors recognized that the issue was not localized, but area-wide. More crews were dispatched. As the investigation progressed throughout the late morning, DEP staff determined that, the block, that a blockage outside of the neighborhood in a sewer further downstream could be the cause. 
They eventually traced the blockage to a 42-inch sanitary sewer located south of the eastbound South Conduit Avenue. The blockage was, unfortunately, in a section of pipe that is beneath a bridge abutment for the 150th Street overpass, which spans South Conduit Avenue, the Belt Parkway, and North Conduit Avenue. DEP tried to clear the blockage by lowering equipment through access chambers that had been stalled in the abutment by the New York State Department of Transportation in 1987 when it constructed the Nassau Expressway and built a section of connecting sewer beneath the abutment. As Saturday progressed, it became apparent that trying to clear the blockage through the abutment was only marginally successful and that a deep excavation would be required. Recognizing the engineering challenges of excavating at this difficult location, DEP crews began deploying large pumps to convey wastewater from the neighborhood around the blockage. DEP teams also began providing assistance to residents to help pump out their flooded basements. That bypass system has been successful in pumping more than 10 million gallons of wastewater each day to sewers that are not affected by the blockage. Regarding the excavation, Two lanes of the South Conduit uh, have now been closed for the last nine days as work progresses. In addition to the difficult location, groundwater has also been a challenge, um, as we heard from, from some of the folks who testified. DEP has hired a contractor to install two large deep wells in the proximity of the excavation to lower the water table in this location. DEP has been working closely with New York State DOT engineers to monitor the bridge abutment for any movement to ensure its structural stability. DEP engineers have concurrently been evaluating whether to simply abandon this section of sewer given its inaccessibility. It's unclear why 1980s DEP, DEP allowed the state to build a highway and sewer infrastructure that has extremely limited access. Today, we require 15-foot surface easements when public sewers are constructed by governmental entities. We are evaluating the benefit of building a new section of sewer around the bridge abutment. Since the incident began, there have been between, one, between 80 and 150 DEP personnel in the affected area each day, and I want to thank them for their dedication and hard work during this time. I also want to thank the staff from New York City Emergency Management, CERT, DOHMH, FDNY, NYPD, DOT, HPD, and the Controller's Office, and also the Red Cross, uh, who have been working with residents in the area. Um, just now about support services. It's often said that city agencies are unable to coordinate with one another, but I'm proud to say uh, that this has not been the case over the past week and a half. I want to thank Commissioner Criswell and the staff at New York City Emergency Management who have worked so closely with my team to provide critical services to the community. I also want to thank the Red Cross, who has managed the reception center since November 30th, uh, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, who have been supporting the community. We've all worked together to share data, update processes, and connect with homeowners. A suite of services of, is available for all affected residents and homeowners. The Red Cross continues to provide shelter to anyone who cannot stay in their home following the backup, as well as sanitary cleaning kits and other services to meet immediate needs. The city is providing professional cleaning services and is replacing damaged boilers, furnaces, and hot water heaters in impacted homes. DEP and DOHMH have deployed air quality monitoring equipment at homeowners' request and have confirmed normal air quality readings at each location. The controller's office has been helping people with water damage claim reimbursement forms and has promised to expedite processing all claims related to this incident. My staff, as well as the staff from New York City Emergency Management and volunteers from CERT, canvassed the affected area multiple times throughout the week, knocking on doors and handing out flyers to ensure that homeowners could connect with critical resources. I want to thank all the people who have been helping to reach the residents in the last week and a half. Finally, I want to reiterate how sorry we are that this happened and assure city residents that incidents of this scale are exceedingly rare. The city is dedicated to assisting all affected residents recover from this flooding. DEP is taking responsibility for the damages caused by the sewer backup. Canvases knocked on every door within a day or two of the incident, many of them more than three times. If you believe that you have been affected uh, but, but have not been connected with city services yet, please reach out. The reception center is still open and we will continue to provide assistance for anyone in need. We will not stop until everyone is back in a safe and livable home. Thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, I'm going to jump right into questions. I know my colleague, uh, Councilmember Adams, has as well. Uh, but there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect uh, between your testimony and some of the testimony we just heard from some of the residents. Uh, you know, Mr. Harmon talked about, you know, still being in a hotel, still unsure when his home is going to be repaired, still unsure on how the, those, fund, those funding sources are going to get to him. Um, so there still seems to be on the ground uh, a real disconnect between the opportunities that you're talking about and getting them to the residents. So how do you, how are we going to address that? Yes, yeah, so um, as, as the mayor announced uh, on when he was out there on Monday, December 2nd, the city is providing services to, to clean the basements and to provide uh, boilers and hot water heaters to those who had damage. Uh, the New York City Department of Emergency Management is coordinating those contracts and I'll let uh, Commissioner Criswell respond. So we have someone in the room who needs those services who's not connected. So I mean, I hope that we are making that connection here today as well. But there are lots of people who couldn't testify, right? They're at work. They're still dealing with this. Uh, how are we going to make sure that they're not falling through the yeah, cracks? And, and I just, before I turn it over, just want to say, we, again, as in the testimony, we've knocked on, on the doors throughout the neighborhood multiple times. We've put flyers on doors right. at least twice. So we've been trying to get the message out, uh, but I'll turn it over to Commissioner Criswell. Okay. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yes, we have um, brought in contractors. We currently have six contractors on scene that are cleaning all homes that have reported damage and have reported that they would like us to assist them. Some homeowners have decided to do the cleanup on their own, um, but if they do need additional assistance, we do have services available. We have a reception center that is open at the Marriott. If they have not yet been in contact with anybody from my staff, they can go there and we can connect them with one of our city liaisons. We have assigned 10 city liaisons, each to a specific home, so the homeowners and the households have a single point of contact that they can reach out to to connect them with any services that they need. We are doing the connecting to the uh, contractors so we can work around their schedules to come in um, to clean the homes as well as to replace the boilers and water heaters. Um, again, bringing the services to them so they don't have to come to us. Are we assisting them with filling out of forms? I know that there are a lot of sort of technical forms that need to be filled out over and over and over again. Are, are we providing assistance that these families can be able to fill out those forms that are quite lengthy? Yes, our, our liaisons that are uh, working with the families are assisting them with filling out forms. We have also heard at the last community meeting that people were having trouble with the online form. Mm -hmm. So we have brought computers into the reception center so we can walk through filling it out online with them. And we have also brought notaries into the reception center for those that prefer to fill it out manually and then take it to the comptroller's office. I mean, I want to address the issue of cause. Uh, you know, hearing it on the news right after there was an, a double victimization here. You know, the families were dealing with sewage in their homes, trying to save their belongings, and in the press, the narrative that this was caused by cooking grease over Thanksgiving weekends was rampant. So they were being blamed for this incident while they're still in their basements pulling their belongings out, trying to save their memories in their homes and what they can. So how do we, how do we explain that narrative being so pervasive at a time when these families needed help and there was no factual investigation that was, there's, there's still no cause this day, correct? That's correct, we're still doing the excavation. So how was that narrative put out into the press Blaming these families, talking about sewer, uh, uh, grease going into the sewers, it was pervasive. It was on the radio, it was on the newspapers, anywhere you could hear, it, this was the narrative that was out there, and yet there was no factual investigation that this was the cause. Why was that out there by several people from this administration? So thank you for that question. Um, as, as the council well knows from the reports that we submit every year, uh, the vast majority of sewer backups and blockages around the city are caused by residential cooking grease. It's not just an issue here in New York City, but around the country. So our initial response to any call for sewer backup is for a DEP truck that has a flusher degreaser to go out and attempt to clear a blockage. That's always our initial response, and when asked, that was my statement. Um, 
we, for this particular situation, again, we noted that until we actually get into the pipe and see what it is, we will not know. But as the council knows, and we thank the council and the members for, for their support on our many initiatives on cease the grease, uh, trash it, don't flush it, fatberg free NYC, you've been very helpful in getting those educational uh, messages out. And I think that's certainly helped a lot to reduce the amount of, of, of sewer backup complaints that we've had over the last several years. Um, but that was, that was the message that we made. I, I, I understand that, you know, usually there's an autopsy, right? Like we, we shouldn't be blaming an issue here, blaming families. Yeah, this is essentially a blame, right? This is attacking them when they're at their most vulnerable, when they have sewage in their homes, and we don't have any factual investigation. That's the challenge that I have. There, there may have many, this could, we don't know what the cause is, right? But we shouldn't be jumping to those conclusions. We should be making assumptions based on previous issues. There should be a respect for the families in question and not being, creating a narrative on, while they're dealing with this, that this had any relation to, to their actions when they're trying to save their homes, correct? Uh, I, I agree, and we're you know, very sorry again about how that was messaged, you know, lesson learned going forward, and, and I agree, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about anything uh, until we have all the facts. And then how do we, you know, sort, of, sort of taking a step back, um, in addition to that, uh, there was this issue around connecting the dots, right? What is the protocol for dealing with 311 complaints how, are, how is the data from 311 being conveyed to the agencies that, that there aren't misses? Because it's been admitted here by DEP that there was, there was a miss here, right? That, there, that things were believed to be localized and yet this was an area that homes were being flooded and that there was an, a lack of awareness of that. So how do we explain the data not getting from 301 to DEP in a way that made sense? Yeah, so Mr. Chair, so that was clear early on that, that it did take us a few hours. Calls were coming in. Uh, the team thought it was a localized issue, but it was a supervisor who realized probably around 8 a.m. that um, all of these homes were actually tributary to the same uh, large sewer main uh, that runs down 150th Street underneath the Belt Parkway. And I think it took us a little time to, to recognize that and to get crews out. Uh, we have been now working with 311 to, to better map out where complaints come in, um, what sewers they're tributary to, and if they all, are all tributary to the same sewer main, the big pipe, then we know it's an area-wide issue and to send more resources out more quickly. And how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Like, what, what protocols are we putting into place? And this isn't obviously on only DEP, right? But how do we sort of, what protocols are we putting into place with 311 that the next time this happens in some other community that this isn't the same response. Yeah, so, so uh, again, I think it's just helping better uh, map out if, if, if complaints get, are, are scattered among different blocks, um, it, it was tough for the folks at 311 and even at our DEP communication center to recognize uh, the extent of the problem. Um, having this new mapping system in place, which we'd be happy to share with the committee and give you a demonstration of, uh, helps us immediately to identify now that it's an area-wide issue, and um, that, that should help going forward. And my, I, I don't want to take up too much of my colleagues' time. I know that council, I know, I know we're also joined by Councilmember Donovan Richards, also of Queens. Thank you, Councilmember Richards, for being here. And, and Councilmember Yeager as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask only one or two questions before I hand it over to Councilmember Adams for questions, and I know there are other questions as well. Uh, relating to in inspection, when was the last time this line was inspected? Because I know you, you've talked about it being sort of very remote. Uh, when's the last time it was inspected? So the, the, the 42 inch sewer main that runs down 150th Street under the Belt Parkway uh, was TV'd in May of 2018. 20 of 18. Yeah. And have we, what is the inspection? Because you know, I know you, you talked about how age is not an indicator of a system that is in, dis, that in, is in disrepair. But we've talked, we've heard testimony from residents talking about how, you know, they need to snake their line twice a year and clean it twice a year because there are challenges. There were sort of, you know, someone else was, was testifying around issues where they called DEP saying that there was still a challenge and they were unresponsive. Um, so what's happening to um, how we're dealing with response? Mm -hmm. 
What are, what are our investigative? What, how, how often are we looking into it? How often should we be looking and sort of doing preventative care on these arteries? And sort of what's our plan moving forward? Mm -hmm. so, so, so good question. So let me start that um, we, we proactively open manholes to look to see if sewers are flowing normally. Uh, and the sewers in this neighborhood it, through the manhole inspections were done in October and November of 2019, so very recent. Um, when we do receive calls about uh, homeowners saying they have sewage backing up into their cellars or basements, we respond. The response generally is we don't go into the homes, but we will open up the sewer manholes to see if the city sewer is running normally. And if it is, we know that there's not a, a blockage in the city sewer, but it's likely in the homeowner's uh, residence, and, and we recommend to them that they get their own plumber. Well, Mr. Kendall here this evening, um, this afternoon, was saying, well, you know, he had reported issues and that his plumber was saying it was not in his home and he was reporting it to DEP and DEP was non-responsive. So how are we sort of reconciling when, if, when they're doing that investigation and they're signing that it's not in their home, it's not on their line, but it's from somewhere else? Yeah, so, so again, our, our response is to, to look at the city sewer and see that it's flowing. And if it is flowing, um, it, it's indicative that there's not a blockage in the city system. And my last question relates to, I know that uh, Mr. Kendall also brought up the fact about uh, investigation, right? That they're not going to be given restitution until the investigation uh, is wrapped up. I know that Mayor de Blasio talked about how the, you know, he was there on the scene, and I give him credit for saying that he's going to make these family whole. But that statement that they're not going to get restitution until the investigation is completed does not line up with that for a very lofty ideal of making sure we're making these families whole no matter what. So how do we reconcile that as well and make sure that they're not having to wait to get all the, the services that they need uh, when they need it, right? The holidays are coming up. They're, they're still dealing with this. They're still you know, dealing with sewage. They're still missing time from work. They're still, you know, their homes, they're still not made whole. How do we do that in a way that's respectful of them? So when the mayor came out um, uh, on December 2nd, he said that uh, the city would provide resources to clean basements, uh, provide new infrastructure for, for heat and hot water, um, and, and that work would continue. Uh, the city's taking responsibility for that. Um, as the investigation continues, we will provide that information continuing to the controller's office. The controller actually has an engineer uh, on site collecting uh, information and will continue to promptly provide that so the controller can uh, process claims. Is, is someone from the controller's office here today? Great, so I mean, I, I, I l hope that we're working in close coordination with one another to ensure that these families are getting both, you know, services on the front end, getting those water heaters replaced, but also getting restitution. Um, so I, I, I know you're not testifying here today, but I'm gonna put you on the spot and say that I hope that we are making a close coordination. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Adrian Adams, so I know whose community was affected and I know has many questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, commissioners, uh, for being here today. Thank you for all of your hard work. And I know that you have to get back to that hard work. So let's get right to it. We, we've noted that there was a slow response um, to the 311 calls um, by DEP. We've noted that several other agencies and entities were on site prior to DEP actually being on site on the 30th. So the, my first question is, given the lack of urgency or seemingly lack of urgency um, by 311 and by DEP, would you say that this situation is unprecedented, this particular type of sewage disaster? Is this an unprecedented emergency? Uh, these types of large-scale uh, backups of sewage are extremely rare. I mean, the last one we, we had was probably more than five years ago um, of this scale. Um, I, I, again, I think it took a few hours for us to understand based upon the, the pattern of the addresses of calls coming into 311 that it was an area-wide issue and not a local street sewer. Um, and, and again, as, as we mentioned earlier, we're working with 311 uh, to, to, to map out those calls so that we can respond more quickly. Um, but again, it, it, it is a rare event. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't happen very often at all. Have you ever seen anything like this in your career? 
Yeah, we, 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 uh, council member, we had one um, in April of 2014 um, at the, the Lindenwood East New York border is about the, about the same uh, extent. Okay, I didn't realize that. How long would you say, Commissioner, uh, how long did it take that repair to, to be completed? I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm, okay. I, I don't know. Um, do you remember roughly the number of residents that were affected by it that? Was a, it was about the same. It was about, about 100. About the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea, um, and, and if you don't, it's fine, whether or not those residents were fully compensated for their damages or not? Uh, I know the controller cut a lot of checks. I, I don't know if they were fully compensated. We could find Okay, out. thank you. Um, what is the protocol involved in response to DEP 311 sewage backup complaints? So, so that's another thing we're working on, Council Member, and a great question. So, so the, the protocol that we've, and DEP has given this to 311, is to tell the caller that a DEP crew will be on site in six hours. Um, and, and that's the, the, I think the answer that a lot of uh, homeowners who called were hearing and getting uh, upset about, they weren't getting good information back. Uh, lesson learned here is that when we do notice that it's an area-wide issue and 311 should be expecting more calls about the situation is that DEP needs to get messaging to 311 explaining what's happening so that uh, folks who are calling frantic uh, with, with sewage entering their basement, at least have a, have a real answer. And what is the communication between 311 and DEP? What, is, what does that look like to those of us that don't understand it? How, uh, connect those dots for us. What, is, what does that look like? Yeah, so, so DEP has a, a 24 hour, uh, what we call our emergency call center. So we have someone at a phone 24 hours a day um, and, and has a computer there as well. When calls come into 311, that data is transmitted uh, to DEP essentially immediately. And then our operator in, the, in our command center will look at it, see what the issue is, and dispatch a, a crew to respond. So on Saturday the 30th, do you think that there was a training issue between 311? Was there a training issue with DEP? Were both happening at the same time during those phone calls? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's between both parties. Uh, 311 was transmitting the information to us. Uh, I think we, again, it took a little time for us to recognize the extent of the problem and we should have gotten back to 311 and explained so that they could have better conveyed the information to the homeowners. Were you aware that a 311 operator responded to one of my constituents that they were taking their call as a courtesy? I was not. Okay. Um, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, uh, the gre grease blockages because I, I am aware uh, that Queens itself has a queen has a grease blockage issue for several different reasons we have a lot of restaurants in queens several different cuisines in queens we are the most diverse place in the entire country and we have many many different and, and, and varying cooking styles things that we like so of course uh, we would expect that there would be issues of grease blockages so let's just get that out there um, that said if if DEP is aware that there are many grease blockages during holiday seasons, let's just say. What proactive efforts have DEP, has DEP made to mitigate the blockage of pipes, knowing what goes on or can potentially go on during the holiday season in New York City, particularly in Queens? So, so two things. Our, our uh, crews are out all the time making sure that sewers are flowing properly, where they do recognize that um, Levels may be coming up because of a blockage they are clearing. Um, but, but importantly, um, we've had several uh, educational campaigns. We've worked with the council on those. Um, we've had a, a program called Cease the Grease. Uh, more recently, Trash It, Don't Flush It, Fatberg Free NYC, trying to educate everyone in the city about things that can go down the drain and things that shouldn't go down the drain. Um, you know, ultimately, it's, it's something that you, we, we want to be uh, just explaining to everyone that uh, what they put down the sewer, and, and particularly now that the, the latest thing is flushable wipes, uh, where the, the cost of removing that material is just recycled and passed along back to the homeowner through their water bill. Whatever, whatever costs the EP to remove them uh, gets, so, so it's more important, the educational program is take that stuff, put it in, the, in your, your 
garbage pail your trash and not down the, the drain. Understood. On the flip side of that, what, what is DEP doing as far as, as far as your end of maintenance knowing that this is a potential issue? Yeah, we, we've, we've done significantly more maintenance of, of sewers in particular years and you know, want to thank uh, Council Member Richards uh, for, for legislation in, in uh, doing better maintenance of catch basins. These, those are the, the, the corner uh, street basins that collect stormwater runoff and a lot of street trash. And we've done significantly more work in the last few years, more, more than ever, to, to clean out catch basins and, and remove that material before it gets in the sewer system. But uh, just in general, the mayor has allocated significantly more resources. He recognizes it's an issue. Uh, and the other thing, too, in Southeast Queens, as you know, uh, the mayor allocated almost $2 billion to install new sewers, larger sewers in, in, in many areas. Yeah, okay. In, in looking a little bit about uh, um, on infrastructure, in, in your testimony you referenced um, that it may, not be it may not necessarily be the age of the pipes that cause issues and, and such, but many residents in Southeast Queens feel their infrastructure has been neglected by the city. So how would you say the age of these pipes compare with those, say, on the Upper East Side? Uh, I, I don't know if that's such a good example. Man Manhattan generally has the oldest. The oldest pipes. in Manhattan. I mean, we've got stuff going back to the 1850s mm -hmm. in a lot of Manhattan because that's that's when it was developed. It, it's generally when when the neighborhood was developed is when when the pipes went in. Um, I, we can we can get you that information okay. though. All right, um, and I guess I'll I'll ask one more question. I may have follow-ups, but if the sewers are regularly cleaned, we know that that legislation, thankfully by my colleague Councilmember Richards, um, has has done a great deal. Uh, if the sewers are regularly cleaned, maintained, inspected, then, then how could this, and, 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 and listening also to your testimony, it seems like there were several blockages at that time going on at the same time in the same area. So if, if we have maintenance of our infrastructure and sewer lines, how could this have happened? So what, what we, we found that day was that uh, there, there were calls coming into 311 from several different blocks. All of the sewers on those blocks were backing up because they're all tributary to one large pipe that runs down 150th Street uh, underneath the North Conduit, the Belt Parkway, and the South Conduit. So it took us time to trace where the blockage may be, and we determined just from manholes at the surface and chambers at the surface that the blockage was likely under it and is under um, the 150th Street overpass abutment just south of, of South Conduit Avenue. Um, that, that abutment and the, the Nassau Expressway uh, was built in 1987 by State DOT. Um, at that time, they, they actually replaced the section of city sewer uh, with a new pipe because they, they needed it, uh, to put in a new section of pipe while doing their work. So the blockage is right in that area. The problem is it's, it's deep underground. It's under an, a, a bridge abutment that we don't want to do any damage to. There's a lot of groundwater in the area. We've been pumping out a lot of groundwater for the past nine days to try to access that pipe, and that's what's taking time. Any idea how long it's been since that particular pipe has been inspected? So, so, so that pipe we had sent, this was the, the, the pipe we inspected in May of 2018. Uh, we sent the camera on the boat through at that time, and, and we, we have that information, but that's when it was inspected. Uh, but again, it's just that the location's making it very tough. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Uh, uh, yeah, Counts okay, so Councilmember Richards and then Councilmember Menchaca have both thank you. questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to my colleague, Adrienne Adams, for uh, all of her work and her staff's work in ensuring we could try to make people as whole as possible. Um, just some quick questions, and, and I just wanted to weigh in specifically on the grease and baby wipe situation. Um, and say that I think it's unacceptable for us to um, I'm trying to be kind with the words I say but there's this perception that people in Southeast Queens just fry food all day and um, and I find that to be totally unacceptable um, we are a very diverse community and I don't think even if we were a community that fried chicken, we're not the only community in New York City that does that. So grease is used in all communities, I'm assuming, and I just wanted to put that out there. 
uh, and weigh in on it and say that is totally unacceptable. Uh, just some quick questions. When do we anticipate uh, your review to be done? So once we uh, reach that pipe, get the excavation done, determine uh, what the situation is and why it was blocked and what's needed to, to do a repair. Uh, we'll, just by the way, we're concurrently uh, looking at building a, a new section of sewer just to the west of that abutment um, if it's just too difficult to make a repair uh, under that bridge abutment. It's, it's difficult to get to, so we're assuming a repair would be tough. So we're also looking at building a new section of sewer around it. Uh, we're hoping in the next couple of days, we were hoping to have gotten to it by yesterday. The, the, the rain impacted how much water was getting into the excavation, but hopefully within the next couple of days. You, you anticipate your review to be done within the next couple of days? In, in a couple of days, we'll know what the cause of the blockage is and okay. what next step forward needs to be. Uh, how's the water table there? The water table is, is, is high. Um, when we started the excavation to try to get down to the, the blocked pipe, uh, we, we reached water that was groundwater that was four feet above the elevation of the pipe. Uh, and so we had a contractor come in, put in two deep wells to pump groundwater so that we can do an excavation. And there's been conversations, obviously, about groundwater across Southeast Queens. Our college obviously has to pump a lot of water every day. Uh, uh, when, are we, when do we anticipate uh, some more uh, conversations around groundwater? This is a difficult challenge, Council Member. As you, as you know, um, it, New York State DEC regulates the wells in the area. Uh, our neighbors to the east, Nassau and Suffolk County, use those aquifers for groundwater, and they have uh, a, a hard time in, in allowing us to think about pumping groundwater to waste. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've been looking at it, perhaps there are individual local areas that we can peel off some groundwater, um, but it, it's, it's a challenge. Right. And let me, and I, I guess that's a conversation for another day. And it clearly was a failure and a breakdown in the system uh, when it came to 311 and obviously DEP. Has there been any thought, because when, when sewer emergencies happen, um, DEP shouldn't have to go back and forth with 311. Has there been any thought about DEP regulating its own calls? Uh, we haven't. We we used the 311 system fairly successfully. Obviously, not not in this case, but uh, we're working with 311 now on a on like a, a sewer mapping system, so that both they and we recognize that if homes, which may be scattered on different blocks, uh, are calling about backups, but they're all tributary to the same sewer, that an alarm bell should go off that something bigger is happening. And how do we? How do? How will? How can we ensure that 311 operators are going to be well versed on this issue? We'll continue to work with 311, and I'm sure they'd be happy to, to come and provide information. Okay. Um, Alrighty. I think that's that's all of my questions. Um, I do just want to say that I thank you for all the work that you have done in Southeast Queens. Um, and all of the investments that your, your agency has done. We still have a long way to go, clearly, in ensuring Southeast Queens uh, infrastructure is updated and, and, and continuously being invested in and also uh, being maintained. Uh, so we look forward to continuing to work with you. I do have faith in you, Mr. Commissioner, so I just wanted to put that on the record. You, I think you've done an excellent job at trying to correct a lot of the inequities uh, that our borough has faced, uh, in particular Southeast Queens has faced for a very long time. Um, so I'm hoping we won't have to be back here again. I think the conversation around groundwater has to ramp up a little bit more, and obviously maintenance is a, is a big one. Um, but clearly there was a failure in the 311 system, and we don't want to be back here again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Richards, Councilmember Menchaca, then Councilmember Ulrich. I want to say thank you to Councilmember Ulrich for sharing his cookies. Um, they came from his grandma, and uh, they're delicious. Uh, I, I want to ask a few questions that really kind of point at the sense of understanding what the problem is as you understand it now. Uh, I understand that you're still in the middle in so many ways about what's happening, and I can appreciate that. In Sunset Park, we have a massive water main break that shot, some say up to eight feet of water out, was it 15 to 20? I, I was there. You were there, um, and your teams are still there doing the work, and so thank you for that. Um, some of the same questions that I wanna ask about that experience, 
uh, and really to the leadership of Councilmember Adams and her team and what I've kind of seen from afar is really about getting information out and uh, the conversations here around Queens being so diverse uh, make me think about immigrants in the neighborhood and language access and ensuring that 311 has information in all the different languages. Do you have a sense of, of what the need is in that area in terms of population and how you're getting information translated and out as people wait for this information? Yeah, so just going back a few weeks ago, there was a, uh, a water main break in Sunset Park uh, that, that there was a, a, a geyser uh, for several hours and until valves were shut to, to control the water. Um, messaging goes out, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Commissioner Criswell uh, chime in, but messaging goes out through the, 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 the alert system that, that the city has in place. I believe those are in multiple languages, but I'll turn that over to you. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, we did send out notify messages that night as well as using social media to try to get the word out to the residents in that community. Um, currently, we can send notify out, I'm going to confirm here, 13 different languages. Um, and so they have access to that in whatever language that they need. So that you're just talking about how you can do that. What Do you have a sense about what was sent out? You can talk about Sunset Park too. I, I, I'd like to know what what languages were sent out, and then also in Queens, what, and where does that where does that get translated? Does that get translated at DEP, or does OEM translate that, or does 311 translate that? I don't know if we have those answers. I know I, I, if anyone. Okay. Yep. Ben, yeah, please. Uh, hi, Ben Krakauer, New York City Emergency Management. Good to see you, Council Member. Good to see you. So we, uh, we complied with City Council legislation that was adopted about two years ago. So the way the legislation was crafted is we have uh, about 130, 140 of our most common notified NYC messages that are pre-translated, the generic version. And then we insert the location of a particular incident. Uh, when there is a need in a particular community for a specific incident, we have emergency contracts that we would activate to do translation. So I'm aware of how the law works. I'm interested to see what was what happened, uh, and if you can have a report on what was translated, when was it translated, when was it sent out. And I'm thinking about Queens and Sunset Park too. But do you have do you have that sense of of what information? And I'm looking for that because there are people who are still waiting for information as it comes out. And our council offices are going to do their job, of course. But there is a local law that kind of forces this to happen, and I'm kind of curious to see what has happened thus far, and what languages are under the law required in that neighborhood. Uh, <clears throat> Hi. So as Ben said, everything is translated. Um, the thing is, Notify NYC is an opt-in system. Can you, just, can you just state your name for the record, please? Yeah, Christina Farrell, Deputy Commissioner on Emergency Management. Uh, Notify NYC, as you know, is an opt-in system, so people have to be signed up to receive it in that language. If no one is signed up in a certain language, there's no one to send the messages to. Um, so we can look and see, but it's a process based on whoever in these communities had signed up in those languages. Um, we are working very diligently to get people. We have translated many materials. We go to many community meetings, as you know. Uh, but one you know, thing that we can always use help with through the council, through civics, through people is helping us get the information to people that don't speak English so they understand that they can sign up directly to receive these notified languages in their language of choice as well as American Sign Language. Okay. okay. And that's not all of it in terms of the – so Notify N NYC is not the only way people are getting information. Like you said, there are flyers. What has been translated and, and what languages have, have – have been translated. Do you have a sense of? Uh, I'm asking for an audit. Yeah. Thus far. So for um, for this job, it is primarily an English-speaking uh, community. So there have been no requests. We have translated flyers and things into Spanish. We have also had American Sign Language available at our community meetings. It was not. Uh, no one needed it. But as everyone comes into the center, if anyone says that they need any language, we have those contracts. We have bilingual speakers in place. Uh, in we can look in your district it, it you know it may be a different it's obviously a different demographic um, 
so we can look to see what things are. But you know, we, we have information based on the census, based on city planning, and so we will look, um, and when we set up a center or when we're sending resources out, we have bilingual staff, we have our CERT volunteers who speak many languages, and if it is not a more commonly spoken language, such as Spanish or a Chinese dialect, uh, as we said, we have emergency contracts and we will get uh, people that speak those languages and also get flyers and things in those languages as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the last question is a set of questions around the testimony that really spoke to the materials composition, the subsurface conditions, the construction techniques, and traffic, which all impact the longevity of a system. Uh, you're still looking to see what was the cause here. Are all those known right now across the whole system? Like, do you know what the materials composition are? Are those things that you review post break of a sewer or a water main break? Is, are those things known? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a, a superb question. So, so we do um, know materials compositions for pipes, I, I'm gonna say post 1870. Um, we have that. When there is a break of a pipe, we, we have a testing lab uh, over at our office in Left Rock City, and they'll do a full analysis to determine uh, what was the, the possible cause, whatever. Was it a materials defect? Was it stress from the, 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 either the subsurface or from above? Um, and we do that, that analysis. But that analysis comes after the fact, right? Correct. And so you have you have you do have materials composition across the entire system post 1870. A lot of stuff is still pre-1870, uh, I'm learning in Sunset Park, and the subsurface conditions, are, the, are those known as well? So, so in areas where we've had breaks and we know that there are defective subsurface conditions, uh, when we install a new pipe, we'll do things like putting it in a concrete cradle or putting in some micro piles to make sure that it's supported uh, going forward. But that's just where you've touched something recently. Okay, so I'm, 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 I'm sensing a lot of unknowns here. And then the construction techniques, probably only where you've recently touched it, where you've kind of aggregated information. And then the traffic, that's something we know, right? That's, is, that a, is that something you gather? Yeah, and, and, and we mentioned traffic because well, we know that we have infrastructure under roadways where there are overweight trucks, for example. Um, there are things that we do when we, we install those pipes to just make sure that they can take the vibration. And that's where I'm going to focus the last uh, few seconds of my, my own testimony here for you is, is that trucks are increasing in our communities. And I'm thinking about places like Red Hook where we have aging, insanely old sewer systems. Uh, I know the capital budget, I think, just recently put some money in there. Uh, and that's where UPS and five other uh, four other last mile delivery companies are coming and you're going to have a massive amount of overweight trucks on the system. And this is where I feel like we gotta, we got to be more proactive in terms of how this stuff happens. And as you still investigate what happened in Queens and what happened in Sunset Park, and I heard Councilmember Richards had a water main break this morning, um, this is just happening more and more. The one knowledge, knowledgeable thing is traffic. We know where the trucks are coming. A lot of these are illegal trucks. And so I feel like there's a great opportunity here to get a sense about, at the very least, where, where our system is getting impacted by massive amounts of traffic. And while the council moves to remove cars from our existence, I hope one day we can live in a car-free city, um, that the, the idea of trucks is not gonna go away. Trucks are still gonna deliver our milk, deliver our stuff, and so I just feel like that's an, uh, an area of opportunity there for multi-agency support, understanding neighborhoods, uh, and I'll bring you back to Red Hook to, to do some of that analysis and, and not wait for them to break, but be proactive. No, thank, thank you for that, and we'll take that back to our engineering teams to take a look at it. Thank you. Awesome, keep up the good work. Thank you, Councilmember Chaka, Councilmember Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to apologize for being late. Uh, that's the A train's fault, not mine. But uh, I did bring refreshments for the dais, so and I'm happy to share. Um, you know, uh, I live in South Ozone Park. I live off Lefferts Boulevard, um, about 15 blocks from where this incident uh, occurred, uh, not far from the conduit. Uh, I really want to commend my colleague Adrian Adams because if there ever was um, 
a voice for her constituents um, in South Ozone Park, it, it's her. And uh, she's done a terrific job really amplifying the, the real concerns that people have had as a result of this, uh, uh, this incident. Um, I also want to publicly commend, I know it might sound very strange, but Mayor de Blasio uh, for personally uh, getting involved in this when the news broke and when uh, things really started to get a little hairy. Um, the mayor himself uh, was in South Ozone Park, uh, was on the phone with all the elected officials, and uh, was really doing his best to coordinate all the different agencies to provide uh, the right response uh, to this, um, this incident. So I, I do want to publicly commend him because um, I know that I criticize him a lot, but um, with respect to how the administration, I think, handled this, I think that they, 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 they have done a terrific job. Uh, I would have liked to see them sooner. I think a lot of people would have liked to see them sooner, but things are what they are, and that just, it is what it is. Um, you know, I'm just curious about um, when people report incidents like this to 311, is there a delay at do it? Is there anything uh, going on at the Department of Information Technology that would delay a reported instance of a, a, a a sewer main break or any other type of DEP related incident, like how fast does that get to the computer at Junction Boulevard? So, yeah, Council Member, so um, it, in this situation, you know, we looked at it in detail, obviously, what happened on Saturday morning, November 30th, and there was not a delay. And generally, what we get from, from 311 is almost instantaneous. But, uh, you know, we can take a look back to see if there were. On, on any other issues of delays. So, and what about the staffing at DEP on the weekends? Is, is it a smaller staff? I would imagine that most agencies scale down the, the staffing levels on, on Saturdays and Sundays uh, because it's not Monday to Friday when, you know, we're involved in a hustle and bustle. Is there, a, is there a considerable drop in the number of personnel working at DEP in the sewer and, uh, division in particular? Is that... There are certainly less than, than Monday through Friday when we were doing more of the, the maintenance work, but we always have an operations crew uh, on, on the clock and uh, are ready to respond at any time. So if, if we had to say that we, there are always lessons to be learned, right, in, in every snowstorm and in every incident, um, what do you think the main takeaway from this um, incident is, what, what do you think that, uh, what lesson did we learn that we don't want to repeat next time, from your agency's perspective, respectfully? For, for, yeah, from my agency's perspective, um, certainly I think that uh, we can put procedures in place to more quickly recognize when there are these large area-wide issues, which are very rare, but, you know, again, we, we, we want to make sure that the next time we're, we're, we can more quickly respond. That's one. And then the second is just making sure that uh, we have folks in the neighborhood uh, to, to explain to residents what's going on. I, I know our crews were diligently, uh, you know, on the other side of the Belt Parkway trying to, to access and, and break up this blockage, uh, but we, we didn't have folks in the neighborhood. And when I arrived, and I know Council Member Adams, you were there and, and, and your staff, uh, I think people just weren't getting good information. So that's certainly a lesson going forward. I think the communication is always a challenge for any agency, and um, I saw canvassers out there, I saw trucks out there, I was driving down Sutter, I was driving down 135th, I was driving down to Conduit, I saw dozens of trucks, and I saw lots of canvassers, and I know that that is a direct result of your intervention, and of course, Mayor de Blasio getting uh, personally involved in this, and making sure that people knew that the city was not going to ignore this or, or you know, just try to fix it and hope it doesn't happen again and not uh, let people know that uh, we're on top of it. Uh, but I think communication is key, definitely important. Uh, but I, I also want to commend you, Commissioner, because I have to tell you that uh, there are a lot of city agencies in the city, and um, DEP is probably one of the, the most unpopular agencies to head, so I don't pity you or envy you in any way, because nobody, uh, nobody thanks you when they flush the toilet and the water goes down and everything is fine, right? But when things go wrong, everybody wants to criticize the agencies. But, uh, you personally have been extremely responsive in my district uh, uh, during Hurricane Sandy and the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, uh, extremely helpful to my constituents given, given the circumstances. And uh, I don't have the pleasure of representing the, the uh, folks who are directly impacted by this incident. I know Councilmember Adams does. And I know that people are very frustrated and rightfully so. They have a right to be frustrated when the infrastructure fails them. But I think that on, on the whole, you have done a phenomenal job uh, leading the Department of Environmental Protection 
And, um, you know, we will learn lessons from this, but uh, I think you and your team are doing a terrific job. And in any way that my office can be helpful to my colleagues, but also to you in particular, I want you to know that we are here for you and we have your back. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Ulrich. Councilmember Adams wants to come back for a second round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly do echo the sentiments of my colleague, uh, Councilmember Ulrich. Um, your, your entire team, everyone has been outstanding uh, during this crisis, and we do thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to get a couple more questions out there because I know that I have frustrated residents uh, who are watching, who are listening, and who are here today. I'm not sure whether or not we can get these answers to these questions today, um, but I do want to get them out. I want to get them on the record. They have to do with finances. They have to do with long-term finances, uh, long-term burden uh, for this community because of this disaster. And again, I have no one to question. So if you will just indulge me in a couple of minutes, jump out there if there's anything that I say that you can possibly answer. Uh, when it comes to boiler replacement, do you have any idea when we're going to start doing that? So that started uh, today. That, that the, uh, the controller uh, registered those contracts last Thursday or Friday. Uh, the plumbers were out Friday, Saturday, and Sunday scoping out uh, all the, the materials, what needed to be removed, what needed to be installed, all the equipment. And uh, I, this, this morning we saw a line of new boilers and boxes sitting ready to go in. Wonderful. Thank you today. That's great. Um, we had questions regarding to uh, processing claims for the record. We had questions regarding um, any type of decision to reject a potential claim, what that would look like. Would anybody uh, in this situation ever be rejected um, if, a, if a claim were to be processed or, or put in? Um, and we especially had uh, questions regarding um, and just noting that residents in the community weren't responsible for the broken infrastructure uh, that caused the damage or that possibly uh, caused the damage. Many may not have the means to front the money to replace furniture, fixtures, valuables. So we wanted to know whether or not there was any program in place to compensate residents who didn't have the ability to pay for damages up front. We wanted to know the answer to that question. It, it, any idea? And if you don't, it's fine. No, we, we, we had talked about that because when we had the, uh, the community meeting this past Sunday, PS223, we heard a lot of that. Yes. Okay, great. The controller may uh, at some point cut me a check after I make my claim, but yes. what do I do now? now. Um, and, and that's a question that we've, we've talked about. Are there any programs for HPD, low mm -hmm. interest loans, that once the controller cuts checks can be replaced? Uh, I don't have information at this point, though. Okay, I appreciate that. Yes. Okay, my colleague is referencing the mayor's fund. We will note that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely note that. Um, we wanted questions answered. There's been uh, insurance, <laughs> God bless you, uh, insurance denial, you know, that we spoke about on Sunday as well. Uh, and, and that's been heartbreaking also to have insurance policies paid and then to have insurance companies <laughs> deny um, uh, residents uh, uh, their, their rightful, you know, compensation and insurance. Uh, so we just wanted to get that out there on record. We will indeed take a look at the mayor's fund. Thank you for that. And once again, we thank you for your testimony today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. And thank you to the 150 members of your team that have been out there in varying degrees of cold and hot and rain. And I know they're out there today, even though it's no one wants to be out there today. So thank you to your team. Thank you to you. And you know, we, our job is to ask the tough questions, but we appreciate the work that you do every single day. So thank uh, thank you. you, Mr. Chair and the committee. And, and again, we want to make this right. We, we feel terrible for, for what happened, you know, and uh, we, we will be out there until it gets done. And I look forward to working with you to not only around how we make these families whole, but how do we continue to move forward as a city to build infrastructure, to, to sort of inspect our infrastructure and to ensure that we are preventing these things in the future. So thank you very much. I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, with that, we'll call up the next uh, uh, group of, of folks to come up. Uh, Lisa George, representing uh, State Senator James Sanders' office. Christine uh, Apa from uh, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Christine, are you still here? Okay, great. Uh, Judith Gomez from Human First. Dale Lynch and Grace Johnson. And there's another panel following uh, this one, so if you haven't heard your name called, you will.
just make sure that you, if you do want to testify, you have to fill out one of these white cards or you're not able to testify. So if you are in the room, and you do want to testify, this is sort of the last call to walk up to the desk and fill one out. Thank you. Ms. George, good to see you. Yeah, we'll begin with you. Good, mor good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman, members. Um, my name is Lisa George, and I work for State Senator James Sanders, Jr. Um, before I start, I'd like to commend the Civic Association, uh, 149th Street, South Ozone Park Civic Association. I've been with them since um, Sunday, the Sunday after Thanksgiving when this happened. And um, I've been on the ground with them. And um, they've been very influential in helping um, me to see um, the needs of the residents and the homes that have been affected. Um, some of the things that um, I've noticed that I'd like to call to your attention is our seniors, our sick, our elderly, and our shut-in. As I did some door knocking with them last week, um, we ran across uh, a senior that's um, 95, 96 years old, who was in his apartment. He was in his house for about four or five days. Um, no food, uh, very little heat. Uh, no one had been to his home. Um, so um, I worked with the uh, Civic Association. Uh, we contacted OEM, and we went to the command post and brought someone over to his home so he can get some services. Now, that was one that we identified, and I believe um, the Civic has also identified a few others. One of the concerns was that um, he um, didn't have anyone to assist him to fill out these forms. And um, as a government worker, I couldn't fill the forms out for him. Um, the Civic couldn't fill the forms out with him. We had to w he had to wait for a family member to come. Uh, I believe it was maybe five days later. They had to travel there to get him some assistance. So um, we have our seniors that are not computer savvy. Um, they don't know how to use the computer. They don't understand these forms. Um, who is assisting them? who is taking care of them, and who is making sure that um, they're not living in this um, waste, uh, because it's not good for their health. And I just want to make sure that uh, between OEM and DEP that they are identifying these seniors that need these services. Um, Again, I know the Civic has been doing a lot of the door knocking, and they have a list, and as they identify someone, um, they do turn the information over, but if that person is estranged from their family or they do not have someone to assist them with this, what services are available for them? Um, I have reached out to the Department of Aging, and they'll be willing to come out and help, but there's a lot of legality, there's a lot of legal forms that need to be filled out, so um, that's just something I'd like to call to your attention. Um, um, another issue that has come to Senator Sanders' office is um, a lot of these basements were used um, where uh, there's a resident, there's someone living down there, there's a tenant, and um, as the Red Cross is housing them now till, um, I believe they're in uh, temporary housing until January 6th. What happens after that? Um, a few of them are concerned, are they going to be homeless? If the homeowner cannot afford to fix the home themselves and they have not been compensated um, from the controller's office to get these repairs done, the basement is not livable in, what happens to those people that are in hotels after January 6th? Um, so these are some of the concerns that have come uh, to Senator Sanders' office. And as he is concerned 
of the welfare of his constituents for food, water, uh, clothing, uh, health. He wants to make sure that they have some place to live um, and that they are taken care of comfortably through, through this um, experience. Um, it's a hardship on the homeowner because if they do, again, as we stated earlier, if they do not have the funding to fix their home on their own and they are waiting for an answer from the Comptroller's office to see how much will be reimbursed or what will be reimbursed, it leaves uh, both the tenant and the landlord in limbo. Uh, they don't know what to do. So those are some of the questions that I just wanted to uh, call to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christine. Good morning. Oh, make sure to click on the button. There you go. Good morning, Council Member Constantinidis, Council Member Adams, and the staff of the Environmental Protection Committee. Um, my name is Christine Appa, and I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is a social justice organization, and we have three programmatic areas, environmental justice, health justice and disability justice. And I'm mentioning this particularly at this hearing because I believe that this issue touches on all three of our programmatic areas. So we find it's very critical for us to offer testimony today. I also work with the Southern Eastern Queens Residents Environmental Justice Council. And in my experiences working with them discussing the flooding in Southeast Queens, I want to bring some issues to your attention. Also, I, on a personal note, I grew up in Queens and I have personally witnessed such flooding. I can recall a time in high school when I had to get off of a bus and wade through feet of water um, because of the, and, uh, the uh, it was a storm, rainstorm. So it's not, while this is news, this is, as we know, nothing new. I want to highlight some of the environmental and social equity issues that are proposed here and also to look at some of the possible solutions that we could discuss. That Southeast Queens has a high water table that um, it's, I believe it demands a unique protocol for responses to um, anyone calling from 311. If people are calling and people are aware that these are the zip codes that have been affected, I think there should be an advanced or enhanced protocol that people should understand that this is not one-off calling. It should trigger um, an immediate response that takes into consideration that this is probably more of a systemic issue. We're all aware of the inadequate infrastructure um, dealing with the sewage and the drainage, but there's also a problem with transparency in the process for inspecting and uh, storm and sanitary drains. We propose that there should be access to inspection records online. People should be able to check through their zip code what is happening in their neighborhoods and how often something has been inspected. Also, considering the population increase in Southeast Queens, there should be some consideration when the when the Department of Buildings is giving building permits and also um, allowing people to increase maybe the size of their homes or allowing companies to come in and construct new facilities, hotels and the like of the demand that will be on the sewage system. Over the past 10 years or so, there's been a large increase in, the, in, in redevelopment in this area that hasn't kept pace with the sewage and the sanitary drains below. Um, we're also concerned about in the aftermath and the exposure to mold, um, the problems with the potable water, the ongoing um, and potentially ongoing respiratory problems that will be caused. Years, after, years ago, I worked in this same area alongside members of council, then council member Sanders staff after Superstorm Standy. And I'm hearing the start of this very same issues that people um, had mold in their homes, how the city would address mold, how people would be able to get reimbursements, but also again, as was mentioned, reimbursements require much cash up front, which leads me to some of the social equity issues. We have displaced families, people, residents with disabilities, residents that may not have an, a set evacuation plan in place. We have issues of food insecurity that come from this, um, water quality, and I propose perhaps considering emergency grants specific to Southeast Queens to help people who may not be able to afford this, the cost up front. We have lessons learned in this city and I think that's one of the, the best things about New York City is that we, um, we're a city that is cognizant of our history. 
But when it comes to environmental matters, unfortunately, sometimes these issues repeat themselves. I also propose that we conduct a study of what was happening with the residents in Lindenwood prior in 2014, prior to their sewage explosion, what happened in, not only in the weeks after that is usually covered, but in the months and in the years. Oftentimes, the city moves on when there's a natural disaster. Pockets of the city can be affected for years, and sometimes people don't realize that this is an environmental justice issue. There has to be equity in the response, equity in the response rate. We're cognizant of the engineering and um, infrastructural challenges that this poses, but I do believe that there are several lessons that can be learned, and we're looking forward to working with the agencies and the city council on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for testimony. Oh, I have to stand up. Uh, my name is Dale Lynch. I live on, uh, I live at 13021 Inwood Street, Jamaica, New York. I've been on that block since I was five years old. I'm now 70. When my parents bought that house, there were only four houses on that block. Since then, they've built homes all around, and we're on top of the Jamaica Bay. That's number one. We used to flood. Slowly stopped. They built houses all around us. And um, the water stopped coming in the basements. Now, this situation is just unbearable because of the fact that we had to wait a whole week. I myself didn't get hurt that bad. I had the water coming in slowly, thank God. So I was up and down all night long, going down the basement, mopping it up, going back up. Every hour I had to keep doing that after I found out that it was coming in the house. Um, compared to the other people, I'm blessed. I cannot complain. I thank the uh, departments, the health, DEO, DEP. DEP, I thank them all because they're, on, they're doing their jobs. The problem is the higher ups where the funds come from are not mm -hmm. coming to the people. So I compliment all of y'all and I appreciate everything you did for us and you're doing for us because they're there every day. They're working all these crazy hours. But my point is the weather's changing, okay? When you talk about making us whole, the only way you're gonna make us whole is to fix the problem so when the snow starts coming and then the snow melts, we don't have another flood. Because I personally had this happen in my house two times. It stopped, and then after we had our second community board meeting, I went home, it kept going downstairs to check. I go back downstairs, there's more, there's more feces water coming in. So that's two times we had to deal with it. And it also did that in other people's homes. They had to keep pumping because it started coming back in. So if you can, bypass the problem and switch our line to another section of Queens, then why can't you, and you can't do construction because the 150th Street Bridge might fall down and you can't, it's too low underneath the Belt Parkway, which is what I was told, and they can't do that. Why can't you deter the traffic on the Belt to another road and do your construction? Well, the 159th Street Bridge will become unstable and it might fall, okay. So he sat here and he said that they could put another pipeline in in a different direction. So why are we two weeks later worrying about the one that's, that's clogged up and what caused it instead of making people whole by putting a connection going in another direction and I don't have to worry about the winter time. When somebody told me, a DEA worker told me yesterday when it rained, he said, thank God it's not a heavy downpour. Do you understand what that means? Thank God it's not a heavy downpour. That means if, if God had opened up the skies and flooded us, everybody in that area would have had the same predicament all over again because it's not fixed, because you can't fix it. So if it's not fixable and you can bypass it, well, that same effort you put on bypassing, now you can take and put another line in to connect to it and get it out of our area so we don't have to worry about any more flooding. You wanna make me whole? Do that. You wanna make me whole? Give these people money that are homeless. Three homes are not livable anymore. You know, talking is fine, but it's time, for, it's past time for action. The workers are doing what they're supposed to do. But you people that have your hands on that money are not releasing it. The mayor wants to make me whole? 
and I'm, I don't have a problem. I don't need, I can, I can live in my house. The people that don't have a house to live in, the man is spending his own money to stay in a hotel. We talk too much and we don't do enough action. And I'm tired of New York City with this mess. My daughter stays on me all the time about moving out of New York because New York will suck you dry, period. And I'm speaking from the heart. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but this is ridiculous. If you can bypass that problem, they can't give any funds until they determine who caused the problem. But in the meantime, I'm homeless. And in the meantime, I'm sleeping in a hotel. And in the meantime, I got to leave the hotel, come back to my neighborhood, check my house, go to work, go to school. I got I to pay bills. I still got to pay that mortgage. Mm -hmm. Are you understanding me? When you walk a mile in my shoes, then you can judge it. When it happens in your houses, everybody who's sitting here who's going home to a nice house and an and odor, a house with no odor, that hasn't had feces in it, then you can talk to us. But until you get to that point, I don't want to hear any more speaking about anything. You all need to be demanding that they put in another line in a different direction, not bypass. What happens when that line gets backed up? Now you're going to have two sections of Queens that are flooded with feces water. That's not a solution. It's temporary. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? Walk a mile in our shoes. You can't really feel sorry for, so you can say you feel sorry, but until you actually experience this stuff, I watch stuff on TV and I feel sorry for the people who even drop a few tears. The next day I'm back to life because it's not me. And you can't tell me you all don't do the same thing. So it's time. You understand what I'm saying? It's time. There's no reason why fun, emergency funds, the, month, the mayor has emergency funds, get it up and get a sideline going in a different direction and stop playing games. This is two weeks, going on three weeks. And I'm stable. God help the ones that are not stable. How do you think the people are surviving that are not able to live in their homes anymore? It's time for y'all to stop talking seriously and get up the funds. People are not able to live now. <coughs> they don't, they, the money that they, everybody lives off their paycheck. I'm assuming all y'all do, paycheck to paycheck. You pay your bills, you wait for the next check to come in to pay the bills. 95% of New York City, except for the rich people, are living like this, okay? The, the middle class man is just slowly being grounded into the dirt. While the corporations and the big businesses are getting more money and I don't want to hear about, because see, there's no reason for homelessness to be increasing. There's no need for people to be uh, foreclosed on. These are all the little people that you guys are sucking dry. And I'm tired of it. I came here to speak not only for my neighborhood, I came here to speak for people on my level. And we're tired of it. And that's all I have to say. I came to give you the facts of what's going on in the neighborhood. People are still walking around with their heads spinning, don't know, they don't know from day to day. How is that a way to live? Thank you, Ms. Lynch, I appreciate your testimony, thank you. Next up. Um, good morning, Chair Constantinidis and members of the committee. My name is Judith Gomez and I'm a residential manager for Human First, Inc. I oversee a home in Inwood Street that houses eight adults with intellectual and development disabilities. Due to their needs, the home is staffed 24 seven and we provide them with ac access to nursing and clinical services and the supports needed to fulfill their life's goals. I would like to start my testimony by thanking council member Adrian Adams and inviting me here today to provide the committee with testimony on the event of November 30th. On that day, I received a word from the staff um, about flooding in the basement. I initially contacted the plumber, believing the issue is related to the house, the house's plumbing. But the plumber informed me the flooding is n not in the basement, it stemmed from the sewer outside our property. After the plumber left, a neighbor came to our house to let us know they and the entire block was experiencing the sewage flowing flooding into their homes. Shortly thereafter, I arrived at the home to assess the situation and found two feet of water and sewage in the basement. It flooded our staff workstation where we kept electronic and paper files of the residents. 
It went into the pantry where we keep our food and other supplies in the house and into the laundry room and the bathroom. Initially, we were told by the fire department we did not have to evacuate the house. However, a few hours later, we were informed that power was being shut down throughout the neighborhood and we needed to evacuate. Being the weekend of Thanksgiving, we needed to find a hotel um, with vacancies to accommodate our residents and their staff. Unfortunately, we were able to secure three rooms in the Hilton JFK for what turned out to be two nights stay. Thanks to the diligence and the hard work of our staff, we were able to pack up the <coughs> residents' belongings, medications, and other equipment needed to provide for the needs of the residents. The damage to our basement was extensive. We lost medical supplies, food, clothing, paper, electronics, medical records. Contractors have removed four feet of street rock from the walls and damaged doors from our pantry, bathroom, laundry, and office. Our new boiler installed early in the year sustained water damage and will need to be replaced. Flooring will need to be taken up and the, bed, the bathroom renovated. Human first believe the damage to be in the thousands of dollars. In addition of all this, we also lost our Christmas trees and decorations, as the individuals are asking for the trees. Again, I would like to thank our staff for being on the front lines and doing an excellent job to making sure our residents were safe and taken care of. I also would like to thank all the city officials who have come to our homes to offer their support and assistance, especially Council Member Adrian Adams' office, 149 Civic Block Association, District Leader Anthony D. Andrews, NYPD <laughs> Detective Tanya Dehaney from the 113 Precinct, who has called to check every day just to make sure we are okay and having everything we need. We've been blessed by the kindness and generosity in our neighborhood who have given us food and replaced some of the essential supplies we lost. And for that, we are grateful. Once again, thank you, Chair Constantinus, and sorry, and this Mary for taking the time to listen and read this testimony. It is an honor to speak on behalf of the residents we serve, providing them with a, a voice and an advocate to ensure they are living safely and comfortable in their homes. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Good morning, all. Um, Grace Johnson, I'm at Inwood and 130th, and I consider myself one of the boots on the ground for that day. And if I did not personally make phone calls to Adrian Adams' office, her chief of staff, we would probably still be out there because calls were made as of 1 a.m., that night, the Viper Squad, the um, fire department that was um, that's on Rockaway, they were out a couple of times. And when they realized that it was more than one neighbor that was having the, the issue with the sewer, because they told them that if it was just regular water, they would have made, been able to deal with it. But as long as it was sewage, they could not have done it. It had to be DEP. And they, they, they pushed it up and they called DEP. DEP did not come out until after 11 a.m. the next day, 12 hours or say 13 hours later when they realized that it was a major issue. Now I personally, I have photos and I went to almost every single one of my neighbor's homes and took pictures. And as Dale said, you really had to be there. The smell, the stench, and you're talking about when you're looking down people's basement or in their homes and you see brown liquid water, you know, and I was an oxymoron, liquid water. When you see doo doo, okay, or shit, to make it more plain, when you see that in somebody's home, it wasn't just a flood. It wasn't just groundwater or rainwater coming in. And when you have neighbors saying, well, I don't know what to do, and they, they don't have the sump pump, you had neighbors who had to go to 
more than one Home Depot to, to get the sump pumps. And then when they had one sump pump and realized that the water was coming in so forceful, they had to go back out and get another one. So you had neighbors who had more than one pumps going. And it was not letting up. So it's like, if the, if the sewage is supposed to be going in one direction, going towards Kennedy Airport, as they told us, and now the water seems like it's coming in the reverse way, what are you supposed to do? You had children who have their toys, Christmas decorations. We, we're getting ready. This is a couple of days after Thanksgiving. All right? Family members, I think neighbors who were away didn't come in until like a couple days or maybe even a week later to realize that their home was flooded, that there was, there was stagnant water is one thing, stagnant doo-doo water. If you ever pooped in a toilet and don't flush right away, can you imagine a days after what that smells like? And what, what I'm here to testify for is the fact that 311 we already know that they messed up, already. The communication, they dropped the ball somewhere, okay? But after you get a call from the fire department, and the fire department is telling you that this is a DEP issue, why should the, the homeowners who made the call have to wait within the six hours before DEP comes out? I, 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 I'm, I'm, it's still trying to wrap my head around making excuses and trying to find the blame for this whole thing that's happened. You already see, I mean, anybody want to see the pictures? I got them on my phone. All righty? And with the report that was from, I think it was Channel 7, Eyewitness News, the, the, the truck came through, they didn't even stop. They came through, they wanted to know what was going on, and then the later on that evening, they made a report that it, was, it had to do with Greece. That's a lie, all right? Because I want to know, would they have, if they had gone into Little Italy, would they have said that there was a, a, a problem with spaghetti sauce? So you, you really have to be mindful of the words that you say and when you say it and what you say because this whole thing is really, really, it's a, it's a black and white issue to me. I'm not talking about color, I'm just talking about it's clear cut. Let's do right by the folks. I mean, if, you, if anybody here go through the neighborhood, it looks like a war zone. I mean, our neighborhood, and I've been in the neighborhood, I raised three children. My husband, Ronald Johnson, is over there. We raised three children in this neighborhood. We've been in the neighborhood since the 50s, all righty? The neighborhood will never, ever be the same. If you drive down now, you are going to see yards and yards of people's discarded stuff. I mean, if you talk about Katrina, you'll remember what Katrina looked like when people had to take their stuff and throw it out. Yesterday, you could not drive up and down my block because we had five, I think it was either four or five sanitation trucks taking people's belongings and putting them in their trucks and taking it away. Do you know what that feels like? Not only is it a violation, it's devastating. You know? It breaks my heart to see hardworking folks, and you're talking about a community that is borderline. Every single person on my block, Inwood Street, we work, we go to work every single day, paycheck to paycheck, to make sure that we keep our yards good. We're paying 85, 95, sometimes $100 to get somebody to come and cut the grass so we can have those pristine, nice lawns like they do out in Long Island, like they do up in Westchester. Now, if you, rode through, if you ride through the block, what are you going to see? It's just going to be, oh, just another neighborhood. We don't want that. We want to go back to what we used to look like before this whole thing happened. 
And with the controller telling us that, oh, the only way that they're going to um, justify the claim is until they find out exactly what the root cause was, it could be the straw that broke the camel's back, I don't care. We need to know, how are we going to refurnish or refurbish the homes that are now down to the studs? Maybe the mayor, maybe the controller, maybe all the governor, maybe they need to come out and also be boots on the ground and go to these homes and actually see what it is, or yet still, invite us to their homes. Let's switch the tables. You guys come and live where we live, and then let us come live where you live. I can almost guarantee you that that place that needs to be fixed would be fixed in a heartbeat. We are not just black and white names on a piece of paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. And uh, just to echo, it, it was an extreme major disconnect, major disconnect. And for this impact to happen to such a beautiful community, as you so very well stated, is completely unacceptable and devastating. Thank you all for being here today. We're gonna call the next panel. Thank you so much. We'll call Winston Horsford, Khalil Anderson, Ronald Johnson, and only Harry Yellow. Thank you all for being here today. We'll ask you to testify one by one. Please state your name before you give your testimony. You may begin. My name is, My name is Winston Horswell. I live 14603 133rd. I, I come today to hear what's going on. Before, before I left home this morning, my grandson is telling me, Papa, find out when we going back home, you know, my wife has said, don't go and say anything, just listen. But I, I felt that I, I have to say something. It, it happened last Saturday, started from some people started earlier, some people, by me, I started to know about eight, little after eight. And it was like, it was like, I don't know how to describe it, but first time I, I ever seen something like that, it was like people basement, the water, the filth, they backing it out in the street, the street is all, water is coming from all direction, you know. And I asked the DP guy in the meeting last Sunday that why you guys take so long to respond. My, it happened a Saturday. My wife had to go there the Wednesday evening by the command center and ask, well, why you guys in disinfect the street? The, the DEP guy said, well, it had, well, before I get to that part, the Thursday morning they came and they disinfect the street and they swept it down. You know, I asked the guy, so why it takes so long to respond? You guys, you was there, you even came in my home. And he was like, well, it have a big, a lot of trucks there and they couldn't get past. To me, that's unacceptable. It happened Saturday. 
Thursday morning, if my wife didn't go and complain about the smell, what it's doing to disinfect the place, it wouldn't have been done. Like, is every time somebody suggests something to them, then they start to implement it, you know? And I admit, they're really working hard, they're trying their best, but I'm saying, something should have been in plan for us, a disaster like this in, this is America. This should have something like to improvise on situation like this, you know? And one more thing before I let my other neighbors take, um, say what they say. If I have to say, if there's one situation or one good happen out of this, I have to say I met my neighbors and I had some real nice neighbors, you know? And one more thing, the, the Red Cross give a food voucher, $50 for a person. The people staying in hotel, if that is done, I would, I would ask if it could be ex extended. Because people staying in hotel, they got to buy breakfast and have some of us unfortunate to stay in the Marriott where we get breakfast, you know. They got lunch, they got dinner. So if it could be extended to help some of the, the people, that'd be nice. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my name is Khalil Anderson. I'm a member of a community board 14 in the Rockaways. I'm here speaking on behalf of this issue and another DEP related issue, just to bring awareness and attention to our uh, proximity as being a Rockaway resident to this issue. Um, I think that I'm gonna start off by saying, I think that when we allow our city agencies and, 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 and the media to traffic in racial tropes, um, the idea that Greece is the primary cause of this, uh, the sewage backed up is, is a slap in the face of the residents, the taxpaying residents that have lived in this neighborhood, as a, as a woman stated before, for 50, 60, 70 years. So I think that when we allow leadership and city to traffic in those racial tropes and stereotypes, one, they must be held accountable. Two, it must be recognized and addressed because if that's what the top thinks, imagine what the rest of the body feels and acts on other issues. So it, it, when, you, when you traffic in those things, you also dehumanize the neighbors and, and friends and families and neighbors who live in this community, and it takes away from the severity of the, of the incident when we, when we have that. Um, I have a few questions I would like to ask on the record um, on behalf of other residents uh, on, in South Ozone Park. Uh, a couple of days after the incident happened, I did assist in knocking on doors with 149th Street Civic Association. Uh, and these were some of the concerns on the ground. Uh, the concerns were there was no protocol for folks who spoke other languages. So if the civic is a primarily English speaking civic, how do we reach out to folks who speak Hindi or any other, the other languages, um, as this is a very diverse black and brown community. Uh, there was no protocol for folks who are undocumented who are afraid to ask for city services. There was no protocol when communities affairs officers whom I was knocking on doors with knocks on your door. It's not the most comfortable space to have a police officer knocking on your door, so therefore folks who are undocumented may or may not answer. Uh, and um, you know, so those were, were some of the concerns that were on the ground. Also, uh, I guess the elephant in the room is that Basements were flooded with sewage water, correct? But many of these basements had tenants living in them. And if they are quote unquote illegal basements where folks are living because we're, we're trying to address the housing crisis where people have very few spaces to live in, will those basements be restored to uh, uh, what they once were? Or will folks be now uh, uh, liable for penalties because they're illegal basements? How long will those folks who lived in stated illegal basements be displaced? These are very important questions. 
Uh, and, and also uh, another question that was raised by members of the Civic who I was working with uh, on those two days that I was in South Ozone Park is uh, usually Red Cross does two to three days, maybe a week of response time. When is the period when it switches over from Red Cross to DHS to begin that work of temporary housing? These are questions that folks are asking. And also just to give a little context as to why I felt the need to get involved in this situation is that I'm a survivor of Superstorm Sandy just seven years ago, where in my home we had five feet of, 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 of water that came in from Jamaica Bay. And although what we went through at that time pales in comparison to what our neighbors are going through in South Ozone Park in many aspects, um, I think that it's important that we you know, recognize that the city is not prepared for emergencies and that in the legislative body of the city, which is the city council, we should be looking at ways to force these various agencies to develop community-centered emergency plans. This is something that we've talked about post-Sandy on many different spaces on how each block, each community can be prepared in the event of an emergency. The difference between what our neighbors went through in South Ozone Park and in the Rockaways is that we knew Sandy was coming. We knew it was coming. Uh, uh, there was weather reports. These folks were sleeping in South Ozone Park. You know, they were sleeping or, or enjoying family time days after Thanksgiving. Uh, this was not something that could have been predicted. Uh, and, 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 and quite frankly, it's something that should not have happened. Uh, and back to my initial premise on how I started, uh, we, when we traffic in racial tropes, again, we take away that humanistic factor of a neighborhood and, and we should not allow that to happen uh, within our agencies. So I, I just wanted to say those words and, and how I personally feel about what happened in South Ozone Park. Now, I want to switch gears and talk about what happened in the Rockways yesterday. So as a member of Community Board 14, one of the agenda items we addressed uh, beginning in the meeting was the issue of a sewer main break or, or a water main break, excuse me. We had a water main break in the Rockaways that affect, affected hundreds of residents, shut down our hospital. Our hospital did not have access to water for several hours. Schools had no access to water for several hours. And we, the only way we found out about the sewer main break and who was affected was by Facebook, by social media. Notify NYC did not send out a notification, and I'm subscribed to Notify NYC, and did not send out a notification about the water main break, and many folks were affected, including my home. We, in the morning, the water pressure was low. It went from low to brown water to no water at all, uh, and it, it caused a lot of inconvenience. So, uh, again, this water main break obviously pales in comparison to what my neighbors went through in South Ozone Park, but it does speak to the, the trend of DEP being under underprepared for these, uh, uh, you know, incidences. And, and we, after this, we'd like to see more preparedness from our, our city agencies and, the de again, the development of community-centered emergency plans. Emergency plans on who we're going to contact, where are the most vulnerable uh, 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 residents among us, uh, where are the emergency shelters, where are the shelters? Because even during Sandy, there were shelters that were slated to be shelters, but they were also in floodplains. So what are the specific community-centered emergency plans to prepare our, our friends, family, and neighbors, uh, and, and, and residents of the community uh, in case there's another storm or any other emergency incident? Thank you for your time, Chairman and Council Member Adams. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Olive Harrelau. I reside at 13326 Inwood Street with my daughter and granddaughter. And my daughter who occupied the, the, the basement has lost everything. <coughs> her bed, her dresser, name it and it's gone. I had a closet there with some of my clothes, all that's gone. And my main concern is when and how I'm gonna replace my basement. I'm a single woman living with, as I said, with my daughter and granddaughter. 
I thank God for my daughter because she did most of the groundwork for me. I wasn't able to go to see this person and that person, but she took it upon herself and she did it for me and I thank her very much. If not, I would, have, would not have known half of what was happening. So I'm asking if there is any way they could assist me. For instance, when this incident started Saturday morning, my granddaughter called me, I was in the kitchen, and my granddaughter called me and said, Mom, Grandma, we're having a water problem. Water is coming in the basement. I thought it was an overflow from my own home, so I called a plumber to come and check it out for me. Just as I made the appointment for the plumber to get there, my neighbor rang the doorbell to alert us that it's not only my home, but it's in the neighborhood. The plumber said, if it's in the neighborhood, he, he cannot do it. I have to get someone else. I called, at that time, I called 311 twice, and I was told the same thing. About 10.30, 11 o'clock, the DEP truck showed up after my daughter had gone to Home Depot to, to buy Actually, she had to buy two pumps because the one she got first was not doing anything. It was too small. So she went back and she bought another one. And then six, seven hours after that, the DP tr trucks showed up and started pumping the water out of the basement. I mean, as I said, we lost everything in the basement. I'm a single woman on fixed income, and it's going to be very challenging for us. Right now, my daughter is getting agitated because she lost a couple of days from work. She could not have been here today because she could not afford to take another day off. And the problem, as I said, is when is my basement going to be put back to livable condition so that we could live as a family? My home, if you come to my home, it's like a storm because everything that we were able to save, pictures on the wall, it's packed up in my living room. They had, my, my, the basement is completely dug out. They started the, the cleanup, and they had to cut the wall from the, basement, from the basement up to four feet. I lost my washing machine, my dryer, the boiler. My home is a two-family home, and there's a boiler for the top floor. Everything is gone. My tenants are out of, hot, of heat. They're out of hot water, and it's just a living, it's just a terrible living conditions that we are going through right now. And I do sympathize for some of the people, because as the gentleman said, some people have it worse than, than we are. I have to go back to Saturday. When the, when the problem started at 11.30, I said to my granddaughter, we cannot sleep in this house tonight because it's, it's, on, it's not healthy. So I checked myself with my granddaughter and daughter in the courtyard Marriott, because I'm just across the street from the Marriott. I had to stay there for six nights. My bill was $1,500, and I was told that the city is not going to cover it because the, the Red Cross had offered me accommodation at a hotel on the North Conduit, which I understand was an hourly rate hotel. And someone from the Civic Association told me not to go there, so I didn't go. They sent me to another hotel um, over by LaGuardia, but that was too far away from home because I was expecting the contractors. My daughter had made arrangements for some of the contractors to start the work, so I didn't want to go that far, and then nobody's home, and then I lose my place online. So I stayed at the Marriott. I had no choice. Now I understand the city may not pay me that $1,500 back, but it, it will be my loss, but at least I was protecting myself and my family health-wise because there's no way we could have stayed in that house because of the stench, and there was no way I was going to sleep in my car. So I checked myself in the Marriott. I'm out $1,500, but with the help of God, I'll be able to recover it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Good afternoon. My name is Ronald Johnson. I take out garbage for that lady that spoke earlier, Mrs. Grace Johnson, who happens to be my wife on uh, Mondays and Thursdays. Um, I just want to say that uh, 
got to say something good about the wife. Um, she keeps me sane. Uh, I love her activism. I'm um, a retired teacher. As my wife said, what happened to my retired husband because I coach and I'm hardly ever home. But a neighborhood person following the footsteps of my uncle, um, Henry Shuttlesworth, formerly president of the Second Van Wick Civic Association. In fact, his attorney res was residing right across the street, Marty Sukoff and Sons. Uh, it pays to be active, it pays to help your neighbors. I'm very sad to hear earlier that a man who would make sure on Thanksgiving every neighbor had turkeys was left in his house unseen. That was Reverend Harris. And I assumed, I'm not gonna throw anyone under the bus, but there's family and they have our numbers. And I assumed that he was taken care of. So that really saddens me, which means we have more work to do as neighbors. I'm glad to see the way the neighbors have come together. Um, I wanna digress a bit to a point that was just, uh, it was addressed to the um, commissioner DP um, who's working hard, but I, I don't like the casual statement of, yeah, the water table situation, that's a story for another time. Not for people who live there. It's not a story for another time because we go on vacations, we always had to hold our breath whether our house would be flooded when we came back. We know it's built on the Bay Area. At one time, Jamaica Water Company would take care of the pump, and I don't know if it was twice a month, and they would reduce the level. Houses are built on a river. So how do you take care of the people who are there, been there, and the new people coming in? What do you think they're gonna think about when they find out not only what just happened, what is the constant in our life? The waters, I'm sure, the uh, basement walls have peeled. Mine has. It's just a horrible condition. My sister got married in that basement. Now it became a storage that we elevate things for fear of destruction, which has happened. So we could have another rain right now on top of this situation. We're gonna be subjected to that same thing. Who's in charge of reducing the water level? That's the elephant in the room that's a constant that won't go away. And uh, I just don't like it casually put down as an afterthought with all due respect to this crucial thing that's happening now. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. As the saying goes, uh, facts do not cease to exist because you ignore them, all right? I'd like to thank uh, Adrienne Adams who and her staff, she got out of her sick bed and came out and people were supposed to be angry, but sometimes you have to watch your anger and say, well, well, where was she? And we had to straighten out a few neighbors talking like that, okay? You're always there. The Civic Association's doing a great job. Maybe this will encourage people to come to the meetings and, and take care of the people that take care of you and function more as a closer community. It's sorry it had to happen under these circumstances, but we'd like to see all these issues addressed and we thank the people who are fighting for us. And with that, I yield the mic. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, and uh, I agree with you. We've been working, I know prior to me being elected, uh, I was working on issues of the water table in Southeast Queens as I was a staff member for Councilmember James Gennaro, uh, who was the previous chair of this committee. Um, and now in my own right as a council member and chair of this committee, we've been working on these issues. And uh, frankly, it's only gonna get worse. With climate change, it's gonna, it's gonna be wetter. The rain is gonna be more. So we're gonna have rain coming in and longer with higher water tables. That's not a good mix. So I recognize the challenges and we, and we are looking for solutions and looking to make sure we fortify our neighborhoods in a better way. So I, I appreciate that testimony. Um, I just wanted to ask you quickly, I asked the panel earlier the same question, but for those of you that have been impacted, how is the city's uh, explanation of reimbursement, of you know, all of this paperwork, what, what assistance are you getting? Is it, is, do you need anything else? There, uh, you know, we have representatives of DEP still in the room, um, so we wanna make sure that if there are things that you need, that there's a connection point um, and that you know, we are getting the full story. So if, if you could speak to the, you know, the process, have they fully explained the process to reimburse? 
uh, the explain the doc how you document the damage in your home like what has the response been from all city entities well I know forms were given out and uh, you're supposed to have them notarized and list your damages and I think this is was it a 90 day period okay but those forms were handed out and okay. I did see them doing door-to-door -door canvas and even yesterday. So okay, seem to be on the on point. Okay. Let me add a little to that. The 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 guy from the the office of the the uh, the controller. Yes. They were saying we could abandon that form and go straight directly to the computer and fill it out on the computer. Mm -hmm. And he's going to look at it. And if we want to take an attorney, is going to go in a different office and, you know, all sorts of different stuff. But we, what are you really alluding to for him to get faster to make any reimbursement for, for us to go on the website and fill the application out? Well, I, know have, I know we have representative of the controller's office here as well. Um, so I know they, they're here if you need any additional assistance. Uh, Miss, I'm sorry. A lot of people have... Oh, make sure you click on your microphone. It's all got to be... I'm sorry. All got to be yeah, recorded. A, l <laughs> a lot of people had reported that they tried to go online to do the forms, but they were having problems. It wouldn't go through. And as one, <laughs> one, one young lady mentioned, a lot of seniors are not savvy on the computer myself included. You don't have to depend on my daughter all the time to do everything. And poor girl, she has to go, she has a job, you know. So what do we do? Actually, I made arrangements with one of the, the members of the um, 149th Street Asso Civic Association, Miss, Miss Cook, to come down to see you on tomorrow, um, Adrian so that I could get some help with my form because I can't depend on my daughter to do everything. She has her own issues, mm -hmm. you know, and she has to go to work. So I'll see you tomorrow, Adrian. You'll see someone in my office tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, she loves you. She'll be okay. <laughs> Can I just piggyback yeah. off of um, what she said? Is there a way that the, the comptroller's office could uh, travel to some of these hotels that folks are at and hold sessions in those hotels so folks can do claims? Then they're not, they're not testifying today, but there are representatives here, and I think that is a reasonable request that you can make of them and that they can help you and answer those questions. Adrian, do you have any questions? Yeah. All right, with that, I want to thank you for your testimony again. I, I, we are working diligently. I know that your council member here is an amazing advocate and is continuing to fight for you every day. With that, I'll call forward the last panel. Uh, Pastor James Works Jr., uh, Ricardo McKenzie, Kareem McKenzie, and Yvette Taylor. Pastor, I guess we can begin with you. Sure. Good afternoon to the council um, members. Good afternoon to Council Adams. I know her. Um, <laughs> we did a couple of things together, and thank you. She was just telling me a little bit about your backstory, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a pastor of, of St. Paul Baptist Church, and we're in a community located at 14802 130th Avenue. Along with the 149th Civic Association, we have been on the ground trying to help the, the community because we're going, um, a lot of times we are overlooked. Overlooked because we have a large uh, contingency of elderly people who are not being, um, their needs are not being served. In the age of everybody's on the computer savvy like that, 
I have an elderly mother I take care of. We live in the community on 145th Street. By the grace of God, we wasn't affected, but um, you know, there's a lot of things that they need and they're not getting the proper help. They're not being served correctly. I have to tell my mother all the times, don't answer the door because people are trying to come in there wearing uniforms and they're not really part of the solution. They're not trying to help. They, they're really taking advantage of the, of the community. And so we, um, you know, we're praying for the community that we will be more aware of some of these people that are not there to do good. Now, there is some that people there are on the ground doing well, and I salute them. But we have big issues, like, for instance, our drinking water. Water now is coming in brown. And even if the water is not brown, how do we know the water is good to drink? I'm just saying, that's, you know, we don't know. We, 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 I'm, I'm advising my people to drink bottled water. Because unless you got something to test your water, you're not sure if you're drinking good water or not. Um, as somebody else said earlier, that community, I've been there all my life. I was born in 68. That community does flood, but I ain't never seen it like this. Feces and just um, feet so dirty water, and it's just ridiculous. And this, by, like I said, this by the grace of God, my next door neighbor got it. The inward, the block before us got it, but just by the grace of God, we missed it. And and it's a shame because it really looks like a third world country there. Um, I'm concerned that are we going to get the help that we need? Like once all the cameras go. Once the news stop reporting on this, are, are we going to get what we need? Um, and that's the concern that I, we have for that community. Also, we need some screening. We need to, because we got young people there, children. Are they being affected by the toxins that they breathing? We, if you walk around that neighborhood, it stinks. The, the, the smell is putrid. I mean, seriously, you can't even drive down here without rolling up your window because it's like, oh, my God. It makes you want to vomit. So if we taking in that type of odor, foul odor, what is it doing to us? We just reaching out wanting help. We just need really help. And we want to believe in our government because we voted the government in to help us. But it's now it's time for the government to help us. And we need, to, we need straight talkers. So I thank you. Ms. Adams, I do. And for others, I come and, you know, you're rubbing elbows with us, letting us know the truth. But we have to keep people, our elected officials, responsible for what, you know, for us. Because if not, we got to vote them out. That's what we, I mean, honestly, that's the only thing we have left. Like, we vote you in, we can, you know, we got to vote you out. And I, that's all I'm saying. I just, I just want to make sure that people know our community is really suffering, really suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, um, council members. Um, my name is Ricardo McKenzie, and I live at 130-40 Inwood Street. Um, before I start, um, uh, you know, this has been said many times over. Um, but I just want to thank uh, a, a, um, a few people and, um, uh, and uh, a few of the uh, offices that were out there. Um, from the very beginning um, of this issue for me, uh, the NYPD has been out there, the fire department's been out there, um, uh, and, um, uh, and also um, Councilwoman um, Adams' um, office ha has been out there from the very beginning. One of the first um, persons that I met was Jamal Wilk Wilkerson from her office, and um, her office has been instrumental in uh, at least um, giving me some direction as to what do you, you've heard uh, many testimonies about people not knowing what to do. Um, I myself um, uh, continue to be one of those people, but at least now I have a little direction. Uh, this issue started for me um, uh, approximately 4 a.m. that morning, I, I woke up, to uh, flashing lights, um, uh, the fire department w was outside, and of course I woke up and immediately noticed um, a an odor. Uh, because um, uh, I had just woken up, I wasn't too sure exactly what it was, but I saw the fire department, and I immediately in my mind, uh, it must be gas, that's what I'm smelling, it, it, it's gas. 
Um, I stood at my windows for, for a little bit and uh, the fire department w went by and I said, oh, well, maybe they took care of the issue. I'm gonna go back to sleep. Um, uh, this was at, at uh, 4 a.m. Uh, at approximately, uh, just before 5 a.m., I get a call from my dad. My dad lives on the first floor. It's a two-family home. And, uh, and my dad's like, um, uh, you know, get up. He's been dealing with, at this point, he was already dealing with it. I found out later for about a half an hour. Um, uh, but um, just, you know, full disclosure, it's already been said, but um, we've lived in this neighborhood for about um, four years now. So upon moving, um, uh, we were told by our neighbors that, you know, um, a, a little water sometimes. So we, we already had a pump and my dad was already pumping, but the pump that we had was doing absolutely nothing. Um, uh, but at that point, we thought we had never seen anything like this. We, it was about a, an inch. We thought the pump would take care of it. Would take care of it. At around 7 a.m., uh, the smell just got like really bad. And um, uh, I have a four-year-old, so my wife at that time took my four-year-old. Um, at this time, it's already th three hours in, and uh, she took him to my in-laws in, um, in in Brooklyn. Um, at around 8 o'clock, we noticed um, my dad and I. My my just to clarify it a little bit more, this is my brother here, and the, the, the basement is, is fully fur furnished. Um, it, it is his living space. Um, uh, and um, uh, at the point, you only hear me mention it, me and my dad, because if you saw my brother at that point, when the water really started rising, it, it, you want to talk about not knowing what to do, he was in utter shock. He, couldn't, he really couldn't do anything but just sit there. So at around, uh, at around 8 a.m., um, uh, my dad and I, um, the one pump that we already owned wasn't doing anything. So we, we run out to a Home Depot, we buy um, a new pump, new hoses, um, make sure it's strong enough. We rush back to the house, we put, we put the new pump in. By this time, um, I noticed that um, my streets were, were um, starting to fill up with neighbors coming outside. Um, uh, what I forgot to mention initially, when the water initially came, it was clear water. It smelled really bad, but it was clear. Um, by around 8.30 or so, it started to get a, a, a little murky, and uh, the, the water started flowing a little faster. I was told that th this was probably because at this time people are waking up, and the people that are unaware of the situation, um, uh, as most people were, um, are turning on, they're using the bathroom, turning on the, the, their faucets and such. So now the water's coming at an at a even faster rate. It's, I mean, it, it's hard to describe. You have to see the, the videos to, uh, sort of, uh, to see the intensity of the, the water at the time. But like I said, we had two pumps going and uh, it did absolutely nothing. Um, um, by this time, um, we just, um, you know, at this point, I had already called 911 several times. Uh, I was then directed to the fire department, and uh, I spoke. I spoke to the fire department while they were there, and they and they told like, yeah, you're getting us because when you call 911, you mention water, and uh, 911 directly, um, whenever they hear water, they turn you over to the fire department. Um, so. Um, uh, the, the personnel that were there said, you know, um, call back, but this time say it's, um, you need a DP, say, uh, say that it's sewage. Um, fire personnel at the time, I personally overheard them, overheard them several times say that this was a DP, that they, that they needed the DP um, out there. Um, uh, I called 311 myself, and uh, twice I, I, I got a run around because it, it, I don't know if the, they just don't know how to, to handle the, the situation or the right people to call, but um, I, I received the, the same information that you guys heard earlier. Um, DP will respond within six hours. Um, uh, six hours went by um, and, and nothing, but the worst part about the six hours is that this is six hours of watching uh, your personal possessions, your, you know, like your memories, um, just, you know, everything that you've worked for every day, just uh, essentially just go up in water. You know, um, uh, one of the reasons that I live in this neighborhood, I, I mentioned I, I have a four-year-old. I've been living in the neighborhood for almost four years now. So buying this home was in preparation um, for my family, my entire family m moved with me. So m my brother occupies the basement, 
my parents on the, the first floor and my, myself, my wife and my son were on the second floor. Now, um, uh, in, in my basement, a, as a result of uh, the sewage, um, uh, as per the cleanup company, PuroClean, um, which was provided to us um, by the Office of Emergency Management, um, uh, they told us that that is category three water. Um, it, it's as bad as it could get. It's raw sewage, it's black, it's murky. As I mentioned at first, it wasn't murky, but after people started turning over water, um, turning on the water, you heard someone else um, earlier say, saying that the water was just cycling through your system. So at, at, at one point, I had um, uh, just about like three and a half foot of water just sitting there for hours. And you, you can see the water going out, but the water coming in. And over the course of, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours, it just turns into black water. And you, you really can't just do anything but just sit there and watch all your personal possessions go up. Now, some may, may say like, you waited that long to, to evacuate the things out of the basement. Well, the, the truth is, like I said, we've been living there for almost um, four years at this point. And uh, as other neighbors have uh, testified, the, um, we've had issues where maybe half an inch to an inch of water um, comes up, which is why we had the, the pump before. And w initially we thought this was the case, you know, uh, so we got our pumps. But even after two pumps, it just kept rising and rising and rising. Um, uh, the, the, the first night, um, like I said, it began like around um, uh, 3.30, 4 a.m. for my dad, um, for me at, at around um, five o'clock. My dad and I worked continuously um, because we just didn't want to see everything go up in smokes or down in water, um, so to speak. Um, my dad was up working for an hour before me, so he worked for 26 hours straight. You know, um, uh, you know a, a lot of credit to him, but I had to tell him to stop because he just kept working and working. He has high blood pressure, other medical issues, and he just kept working. I myself, it was 24 hours, but it was 25 hours for him. And at, at, at that point, we had already, um, uh, I said my son was already in Brooklyn with my in-laws. Um, uh, the, the adults, we had to find some place to stay, so we just, um, we booked uh, a, a hotel room. Um, I live directly next to um, Mr. Leron Harmon, who testified earlier. Essentially, he lost his entire house, uh, I, I will say. Um, but I received a call from him. Um, he's, he slept in his car that night. I received a call from him um, at approximately um, 5.30, um, no, no, not five, maybe around seven o'clock in, in the morning. Um, uh, he called my dad, who in turn told us, hey, the water's coming back up in my, in my basement. You guys better rush over here. So we rushed back over there. The hotel was about uh, five minutes away. We rushed back over and um, lo and behold, um, th there's water coming back up. And uh, this is when it, it reached it, 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 its highest point. Um, uh, when the water completely re receded, and um, uh, you know, I have to give credit where credit is, is due, um, uh, the Office of Emergency Management immediately jumped in. And uh, you know, at this point, it, they were talking about cleaning crews and, and things like this. Um, uh, they had surveyors going around. and. Uh, um, I received many um, estimates, but finally what I was told was um, in, in my home, everything um, four foot and below had to go. So if you look at my basement right now, you know, imagine four foot tall and everything down there is completely um, gutted. At the time, they did not remove um, the, the, the tiles on the floor, even though it was a, it was a concern. We didn't find out until, well, at first we were told the tiles that, that they're not gonna remove it, but um, as per um, uh, the meeting that they had at PS223 last Sunday, um, um, uh, Commissioner Criswell said that the tiles could be uh, removed. But at, at this point, th this is after the, the cleanup had already started at my house, so I still have the, 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 the tiles there and uh, I am worried that like, um, you know, water seeped under the tiles and then, you know, maybe a year, who knows how long from now, I'm gonna have a, a, a black mold issue. Um, you know, it, it, it's, like, like I said, the, the area was a, a living space for my brother, but we also have, uh, you know, we had um, storage down there. 
So, you know, w one of the, the things that, you know, plays over in, in my mind now was that um, when I had a, my own personal project where I was like digitizing, um, uh, you know, like photos that my family members had from like the 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, that was one of the things I was just thrown out. You know, so it, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's really like hard to describe, but I'm pretty sure you guys can look back at some of the videos. And it, it's, it, it's the first time that I've really seen defeated people. Now, this is a happy neighborhood. You know, um, someone mentioned one of the best things that came out of this was no, getting to know my neighbors a little bit more. I've lived here for four years, and um, I know the, the, the neighbors I I immediately um, next to me. I don't know everyone, but I can say that they're happy people. It's a happy neighborhood. It's a middle-class neighborhood. These are all people that go to work every morning and do exactly what they're told to do. Follow all the rules, you know, go to school, um, you know, get a degree, get a good paying job, buy the house, have the family. That's what we did. And, you know, to, to, to just wake up and have that go up in smokes in, in, in two seconds with no certainty. Um, you know, I, 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 um, also at PS223 on Sunday, um, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Su Yun Kim spoke from, from the, um, the, the comptroller's office. And, you know, to say I was, you know, disappointed, you know, you, you, we all heard um, Commissioner, Commissioner, um, not Commissioner, uh, um, Mr. Sapienza, um, okay, Commissioner Sapienza, we, we, we all heard him, um, you know, at least take some responsibility um, um, for it, but before this, it, it was all about fault. You know, the meeting on Sunday, you know, I, I, I told them that it, it's not about fault, it's about re responsibility. You know, when you start playing, you know, um, someone mentioned um, the, the racial trope that, 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 when I, that when I, I didn't want to read his statement as, as a racial trope, but I, but I can tell you, you know, based on, um, you know, just li little sleight of hand jokes from, um, you know, family members that might not be feeling it so much, and from coworkers, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, things like, oh, so you guys use too much cooking grease this year, huh? It, it, it's, it, it's, it, people have to be way more careful with this. It, 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 it's, it's like, it, it, it might have been a, a, a factual statement, but given the area, given the demographics of the community, it, not everyone read it as, as like, oh, this is just fact for the entire city, because I've heard it all, all, already. You know, um, at, at this point, um, I haven't been, you know, my son hasn't been home um, since the, the incident happened. We've, we've gone to, to, to see him. But I, I mentioned that, like, um, like in, right before we went to the meeting at P, PS223 last Sunday, my wife calls him, and he's four years old. He doesn't, you know, all he knows is that the house is stinky. You know, it's like, that's what we told you. You can't come back yet because of the, the house is stinky. But he's literally crying because he hasn't been away from us for that long, uh, you know, long of a time. So, I, I mean, at, at, at this point, um, I, I'm happy um, that, um, so, that some fault um, um, has been um, taken now, you know, Where's the responsibility? I, I, um, speaking a, a, about the cleanup, I have to say that, that um, as far as um, uh, the, the initial cleanup w w um, uh, by uh, Commissioner Criswell um, with the Office of Emergency Management, as far as the tearing down the walls and, and, and the cleanup, that was very, as my experience, it was very well coordinated. Um, I was receiving, um, calls probably like every two hours, calls, text messages, people were, were really understanding. Uh, the, the, and this is no fault, I, I don't wanna place too much fault because I understand it's a big issue and coordination is, is gonna be hard, but the, the DEP has not, been, has not been as well like put together. You know, I'm not gonna mention any names, but you know, um, yesterday, um, so I, I haven't been at work since the incident happened, and uh, um, my job has been 
um, really, um, really good in giving me the, the time off. They don't have to, they can make a much bigger stink about it. Um, uh, but it, it, they, you know, they, they, they want me back. Uh, I, I, know, I know that for sure. And you know, for, for this is New York City and for anyone that works in corporate America, you know that you, you either perform or you're out. So it, 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 it's like, you know, when, when HR departments to start to make their cuts, they don't care that you had a flood in your house or, they, they, or they're, not, they, they're not made abreast of that information. So the, even though you know, my, my management says everything is fine, it's something that weighs heavily in the back of my mind that it's like I'm not at work performing like I'm supposed to be. You know, um, it, it, it's, it, 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 I don't even know where, where, to even, where to even begin. I have to say that b between myself and my wife, um, we've been calling every day. We've been talking to you know, the, 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 the pretty much the same people every day and, and everything went well. But yesterday, um, you know, on, on Monday I was told you know, uh, to, to stay home. I'm gonna, we're gonna have someone come in, take out your, your, the two boilers that, that, that I, the two water um, um, boilers that, that I lost and, and, the heat, and the two heaters for the house. Um, I, told, I was told that they, were, they would come, they would rip that stuff out, and they would replace it with, with, with the new stuff. Um, they, I stayed home all, all day. The contractors came, and they did about two hours of work, left the stuff in my house. Um, I called um, the, the, the people, in, um, uh, the powers that be in charge for, for, um, for that project. And um, uh, you know, I was told that they had issues sourcing the equipment, which is fine. Uh, I, I, I understand the, the, the challenges um, ahead, but you know, sometimes we speak to, uh, I speak to one person, my wife speaks to someone, someone else, we're getting completely um, different I information. So she actually, um, uh, because I'm, I'm at home and I'm working from home uh, as, as my job has allowed me um, to, to do for, for, for two weeks, my wife goes down to the, to the co command center just to, to get an update of, what, uh, of what's ha um, happening. I, I have to say that she's been going down there every day and maybe she's been a, a little pestering uh, uh, about the, the, the situation. She's eager to get our son back to the house. And the two things that we need to have uh, the, the house livable at, at, as per New York City is uh, heat and hot water two of the items that we, that, um, that we don't have. So she goes on there and you know, she's trying to find out wh what happened because the, the contract contractors came, they, they disconnected the, the, um, uh, the, the water boilers and the heater, they left it in a corner in the basement. They added the, the new boilers, but then they left. And like I said, hours went by and, uh, and, and nothing. So, so she, she went down there and um, she called me back, like, um, you know, a, 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 a bit upset. She, she was upset by, I, I won't mention his name because my experience with him was good up until this point, but she said he, he, bas he basically scolded her and told her that um, if, if we can't wait for, um, if, if we can't wait for them to come around, for DP to come around and do these things, then we should go out there and just buy it ourselves. Well, you know, he was here today and, 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 he, and he left at this point, but we can't just go out there and buy it ourselves. It, 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 you know, I, I mentioned this is a, a working um, class neighborhood and, you know, it, it's like um, I'm already looking into savings, retirements, things like that, borrowing, um, you know, all things that are gonna come with penalties um, that I'm not, I have no idea if I'm gonna be reimbursed for it because as per Mr. Suyeon Kim, when you fill out that form, it's an opportunity to get your money back. Not that you're gonna get it back or not that we're going to review everything, it's an opportunity to get your money back. You know, it, 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 it's, that's just language that just, you know, is, is un unacceptable, especially when the same office is telling us don't lawyer up, don't go to lawyer. We're gonna get defensive, it, 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 we're gonna get defensive if, if you get a lawyer. You know, so, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Just sit here and just, just hope, 
pray that like something's gonna happen, like uh, you know my savings are being depleted. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my house. Essentially, it's unlivable. It's unlivable as per the city ordinance. It's unlivable right now. But I'm afraid to leave the house because I, I, um, right now, as per DP, they're pumping 10 million gallons of sewage from one pipe to the um, to the next, which I might add has to be a pretty expensive. Um, uh, a, a pretty uh, exp expensive deal. But if they stop or more water comes or things like that, I can see water rushing back into my basement because the problem isn't fixed. They've just put a Band-Aid on it right now. So if they stop or they, if they miscalculate how much water's coming in, it, it's, I'm, I'm back to, 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 to round one. You know, it, it's, like, like I said, I, I was at um, uh, Councilwoman um, Adams' office last week um, uh, she had a lawyer um, that, that's there every Wednesday to anyone that hasn't made use of the, those services. But it, it, it's, uh, it, it helped me a bit to, to uh, get focused on, on, on what needs to be done. But as of right now, with the, the holiday seasons of, uh, approaching, Thanksgiving ha just passed, and I, I'm in this mess right now. It, it's you know, I, I'm, I'm just left not knowing as, exactly what to do. When am I gonna be able to go into work? You know, the, the, they were providing me, um, they, the, um, the DP was providing me, you know, just uh, notes every day saying that, you know, Mr. McKenzie is required to be home for this reason or for that reason, but, you know, how much longer is my job gonna accept that as well, you know? Like I said, I work in the private sector, and it's something that weighs heavily on my mind every single moment until this is fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hello, uh, my name is Kerry McKenzie. Um, that's my big brother. Um, I'm not gonna get in too much detail. We all know 301 DEP, um, uh, they messed up big time. Um, I just want to take you back to the night. I actually um, live in the basement. Um, I actually woke up to that smell. So hopefully ingesting that doesn't do too much to my health. Um, one of my biggest obstacles right now is just getting to work. Um, a majority of my winter clothing was ruined. This is the only sweater I was able to find today. Um, this is the only jacket I have. It's getting a lot colder outside. So just getting to work is a difficulty. They're doing a lot of construction um, uh, in that area. So the buses, they're gonna take even longer. Thank thankfully, my job, they granted me temporary parking just to you know, be able to get into work so I don't have to go through the cold. But that's temporary parking. So that's, um, you know, this has been a r real big nuisance, just finding clothes, because whatever clothes I have left, it's, they're in bags all over the place. So getting to work, I have to wake up earlier just to look for clothes. I have to drive, which is just driving up my expenses, gas, toll, so, um, it's everything, everything, my day-to-day -day life is just an obstacle. You know, we have to think 10 steps ahead about what we're gonna do just to get through the day. Um, but I think my biggest concern, my biggest in issue is the claim and reimbursement process. Um, the process isn't as clear or as straightforward as Mr. Kim made it sound. sound. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things. It's a very agonizing process. You know, the website was down. Um, everything that was lost, you just don't have reimbursements for it. It feels like um, he's lacking empathy and sympathy for the situation. Just, just fill out a form within 90 days, 90 days form. All right, we're still assessing the damages. Um, it's hard, to, you know, everything was in, everything was flooded in sewage. So just remembering everything you lost is a, it's a process. 
but he keeps saying 90 days, 90 days. He, he's, use, he's using legal terminology, but then he's instructing us, don't get a lawyer because we'll wa waive certain rights. It's, 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 it's not as straightforward as he's making this sound. Um, who knows what, uh, what other long-term issues we're gonna have due to this flooding. For example, I just thought about the lawn. You know, our lawn is ruined. You know, possible mole issues. Rebuilding and rebuilding the basement. We, we don't have any quotes for that. So how, how are we gonna, um, uh, you know, submit claims for that if, uh, if, if we, don't have, we don't have any assessments? What I think needs to be done is we need people from the comp controller's office to walk us through the process. Let us know any possible roadblocks we, we're gonna face. We, we've, we've all, um, I'm gonna be honest, I feel very uneasy about the, unclaimed pro the claiming process. We, we've heard, we've seen the news with Sandy victims and other um, um, high profile disasters, you know, the back and forth, the political games. So I'm very uneasy about the process. So when you have someone rushing you, submit this in 90 days, submit this, you have a opportunity to get reimbursed. That, that doesn't make me feel very comfortable at all. Um, we, we, um, you know, as the weather gets colder and we don't have any heat, how's that gonna affect our pipes, other issues in the house, causing additional damage? Yet he wants us to submit a claim form within 90 days. So I believe um, the services that, have, that has been provided so far, thank you very much. Um, they've been very helpful, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done still. Um, there needs to be a lot more sympathy for everyone dealing with this. It's not easy. Everything, just taking a shower, it's, it's we have to go to a hotel. Um, another big issue I have is um, we live on Inwood Street. We're, we're literally five, mi five minutes walking to the hotels around there. When we called up that night, they knew nothing about it, and they just offered us our, their standard rates. Um, the hotels that were provided, first one was in Astoria. Now we have to, now Astoria is about 15, 20 minutes, but we all know the Van Wick is always crowded. So let's add 45 minutes to that. While we have to worry about our house, while we have to worry about our house maintaining our home, to avoid any additional damage. So um, I'm really, um, I don't know whose job this is, but I'm disappointed that the local hotels, they weren't, they didn't provide us additional assistance. And as my brother stated, and a lot of other people here stated, we're all working class people. We don't want any handouts, but even a discounted rate at these hotels would have been, would, would have made a big difference and um, you know they're continuing to build hotels. We don't we don't know if those hotels have any issues to do with the uh, the sewage backup. We don't know what tax incentives they get to build hotels, which we pay regularly. And then you know they seem like they knew nothing about it. Um, you know we just um, uh, we just want we just want this issue to be prioritized. Um, uh, the back and forth is very agonizing. We want, we want to be prioritized. Um, uh, you know, we don't, we're not asking for any handouts. We just want our life established, you know, our homes rebuilt, because this isn't our fault. And the, uh, and the message that's being put out there is we're just pouring grease down the sink. And that's absolutely not the case. But what we really need is more than one person from the comp controller's office to have a real talk with us. You know, we need a timeline, the process, any issues that may happen, because we're just getting legal jargon. 
but yet he doesn't want any lawyers involved. So we, we, we need people from that office to come down and tell us what they need, any issues, ex armor, whatever they need, we could provide it, but they have to tell us that. What I, what I fear is we're gonna submit the form. Even on Sunday, I mentioned it. On the website, they had water damage and property damage. Well, we don't know if, we weren't clear with which form we have to fill out. Mr. Kim, he, he clarified it was water damage, but my biggest fear is we submit the forms, we go through the, the, the steps, and then we find out there is an issue, we have to start the process all over again. It's a slow, agonizing process, and I wanna minimize mistake, mistakes as much as possible. So they need to come down and tell us exactly what needs to be done. The mayor said we would get expedited services. So when I hear expedited services, I'm not only thinking about cleanup, I'm thinking about reimbursement and, and restoring our homes. Um, you know, as my brother mentioned, we're, we're ready to work. My dad, he worked 26 hours straight trying to fix whatever he could do. We're ready to work, but they have to, they have to give us answers. And we don't want to play the political, legal, back and forth game. We just want straightforward, and we want these services expedited. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll just interject just a little bit, uh, Mr. McKenzie, for um, clothing. -ish. Give us a call. All right, thank you. Hi. Make sure you get your microphone's on. Turn it off. Is it on now? Yes, we hear you. Thank <laughs> right. you. My name is Yvette Taylor. Um, my home is at 130-40, 146th Street. So it's right behind you guys. Um, my parents bought that house in 1973. They finished the basement with two bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, a living room area, um, and a wash area. Um, we've also had those backup issues all those years. <laughs> and because it was just our house at that time, we were responsible for cleaning it up as everyone else. So <laughs> I was in, and my mother, in Georgia for Thanksgiving. My family was there, and we have one tenant upstairs because it's a two-family home. And from 5 a.m. on 11.30, my family member kept calling us and telling us that the water was coming in and it was clean. So we thought it was the normal stuff and we called our warranty people and the warranty sent out a plumber and the plumber said, it's not us, it's outside. Called 311, we called 311 we were told the same six hours. Um, call us back in six hours if you don't hear from someone, is what they told us. Um, then we found out that it was a city thing. We found out the water was coming up. Um, and I have pictures and videos and snapshots of every single part of what has happened. So, um, after we found out that it was the sewage, my family member that also lives downstairs, everything was gone from five in the morning to at least one in the afternoon. Everything is floating in feces. We kept saying water and my sister kept saying it's sewage and that's exactly what it is. So we go through that, we have a sump pump since we've been there so long, there's a sump pump. The poor little thing just was trying to get the water out and the water was just coming in. So my cousin went down to the corner and I don't know if it was the DEP or the emergency people, but she got them to come and help pump it out. They said, we'll be there. And she stood there and she waited for them to come. Um, so they were pumping, we were pumping, water's going out, water's coming in and they continued to do that all night. 
It finally went down some, and then the next day it came back up. So <laughs> it, it, it's so much, it, it's so many different things. Um, the Red Cross and everyone else, they have been great, they have been great. But let's fast forward a little bit. So I came on Saturday because they said they wanted to start the clean out and somebody needed to be there. So I let them in. They had to come in from the first floor to go downstairs. And when we opened the door, I could have been knocked over by that smell. I mean, of course you can smell it from where the Marriott is to where the home is, you can smell it. The cleanup worker said, I need a minute, and he had to go outside, get all his protective gear on, and then come back in to get himself prepared to go down there. And again, I have all those pictures. The water that was in our basement went anywhere from four feet to six feet. So everything is destroyed. And every time I hear someone sit here and say that they want to make us whole again, putting two furnaces and a water heater is not making us whole. <sighs> My family also does not have my understanding of reimbursement, you ask the first set of people what reimbursement means to them. That means to me, you pay out and then you get reimbursed. That, that's my understanding of it. The homeowner's insurance that we called, the gentleman came out to do an assessment and because he couldn't get inside, all he did was look from outside because he couldn't step in it. And he deemed that it would be thousands of dollars. We don't have thousands of dollars to put out to get it reimbursed. I was angry on Sunday when I went to the meeting when I heard them say, there's a chance, you know, there's a chance you might get reimbursed. There's a chance you might get reimbursed. After I calm down some, I understand that they have their rules too, and they need to know what the issue is or who's at fault. At the same time, we have six feet of sludge in our homes. Memories are gone, things are gone. I don't know about everybody else, but we don't have receipts from 1975 to show all the things that we've bought, all the things we've done, all, all the things that, are, that were down there. I feel defeated as a resident, as a taxpayer, as a homeowner, as a person, I feel defeated because I feel like they're not partnering with us to help the situation, which makes it worse. It makes it worse. I had an interview and I told the person that I spoke with that I just feel like giving up sometime because it's too much. I'm not gonna do it because that's not how I was raised, but it's how I feel. I don't have any confidence in the city. I don't have any confidence in the DEP. I don't have any confidence in the Comptroller's office. I would have to have somebody tell me why or show me why I should have that confidence or why they should deserve any of my confidence because they're not showing that. My mother is 82 years old. Um, 
the tenant that's upstairs, she has a son that's three years old. Even though the first floor and the second floor didn't get touched by water, I'm not sure that anybody is realizing or acknowledging the toxins that have went through everyone's homes. So even though their stuff wasn't destroyed by water, I don't feel confident in having that three-year-old go to sleep at night and then 10 years from now, his lungs are coming up because of the toxins that's in there. Nobody's telling us how to clean the things that didn't actually get touched by the water. In this claim, one, one good thing came out of Sunday for me is, and I could be wrong, but the way I'm interpreting is if you start the claim, you could always go back and add. Now that was something that I didn't know and I still don't trust it. So let's just be clear on that because it says you need to put a total number and something on there, and, and I could be quoting it incorrectly, but where the total is, it says you only have this one chance to do that. So I did have trouble electronically doing it, but even while I was trying to get it done, I'm saying to myself, how could I possibly know what that total number is? I, I won't know what that total number is. Now, of course, I could go on there and put 200 or 500,000, knowing that it's not that much, but is that what I need to do in order to make sure that everything is covered even when I come back to add something else to the claim? So part of my not completing the claim just yet because I understand that it's fixed. As of Sunday, I hadn't put it in because of the fact that I couldn't get it on, but I'm understanding that it's fixed and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna do it because I still have everything written out. But even when you have it written out and they have someone, a notary posted at the command center at that Marriott, my understanding is you get it notarized, you still have to take it down to the controller's office yourself. That's, I could be wrong, but that's how I understood it to be. I work. Um, but I also take care of my mother. So in me trying to keep this stress off of her is doing a lot to me as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally lost. <laughs> I'm totally lost. I don't know what to do. They cleaned up. At first they told me that they were gonna make three different piles. One of is if things could be salvageable, then they'll have that. You can go through it if there's something else and then the things that are, that are completely done. They threw everything away. So nothing was sal salvageable. My apologies on that. So two furnaces and a water heater is not gonna get me back to be whole. It's not going to get my family back to be whole. It's not going to get the things that we did buy and have down there to be whole. Um, and then I had to fight with them to come back and pick up the floor because I, we, we initially, I think that we were told that it wasn't, but then when we brought it up on Sunday at that meeting, then the young lady said, yes, we will. And then when I went back to the house on Monday night, the floor was still there. And then I had to talk to someone and then they came back and he said, I walked over there myself. This is a volunteer of which I appreciate every single one of them. And he said, I walked him over there and they started pulling it up. Now the bathroom, I was told by the restoration company that because the bathroom had tile, um, excuse me, ceramic, that it's fine, it's not. So, so, when you, so they left it, they left the toilet bowl, the sink and the tub, but underneath it, it runs like it's a crawl space which has wood under there. So I'm saying how could it possibly be safe for that bathroom to be there? But if I tell them to remove it, then it's gonna be my responsibility because they're being told that if you can clean it, then you leave it. So my, is, the basement is down to just studs, 
which is also wet all the way up to the six feet. So if you have those blowers blowing and you dry that out, for some reason they believe that that's gonna make it safe for me to be back in my home or my mother to be there or our three-year-old tenant. And, and I do not believe that that's what it's gonna be. I really honestly don't believe that. And then, <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I have no idea on what to do. And I'm an intelligent person and I have a, no idea on what to do. And I don't feel like I'm getting straight, concise answers to the concerns that we have. The gentleman sat here and said, this very rarely happens. And with all due respect, who cares about it rarely happening? It has happened now. So what didn't happen before, to me, doesn't matter. It's happening now. Whether it was rare or not, it's happening right now. And right now is when we need some type of answers. And also, if you gentlemen were there on Sunday, on Sunday, we were told in a couple of days we're gonna know what's happening. Now it's been a few days, because today's Wednesday, and again, we were told we're gonna find out in a few days what's happening. And then in the next few days, are we gonna keep being told what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? Because they still don't know yet. And if you don't know, how could you possibly say that this is what needs to be done? And just for the record, I was personally offended about the grease being thrown down. Personally offended. So please be very, very careful on what you say and how you say it. And I appreciate what you said earlier about we were being down and then you just dumped it right on top of that. That was not cool, especially when you didn't know what the issue was. Just say, we're working on finding out what the issue is and whatever. Don't say that that's what we're gonna go with because that's what it normally is. Not cool, not cool at all. And, and again, I was personally offended by that because it, it shouldn't be. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna do. I don't, I don't have a suggestion to what the answer should be, but I know that when I look up here and I see it says a government of the people, by the people, for the people, the whole time, that I've been here since about 10 after 10, I've been staring at that and in my mind saying, yeah, right. And that's just how I feel. And it's sad that I have to feel that way because I really shouldn't, I really should not. So I, I, I don't know what to do, I, I really don't. So I'm welcoming all help, um, all honest and truthful help and, and if we ask you a question, please just tell us the direct answer directly. Don't point us out to, well, legally is this, and we have to do this, and we have to do that. Just, just, just work with us and, and, and help us out, because you know it's not our fault. Even though you don't know whose fault it is, you know it's not ours. So there was another young lady there on Sunday too that said, so why can't we be compensated and have our homes fixed and then the city or whoever else sit around and wait for it to be decided on what can be done? That works for me because you know it wasn't us. So I don't know, but thank you for listening and thank you for being here. And hopefully this is going to spark some real opportunities to get all of our families back as a whole. Thank you. I just wanted to thank, um, thank all of the residents once again. Um, the three of you brought it home, uh, for lack of a better way to express that. Um, as one who, you know, pretty much lives five minutes away, 10 minutes away, myself have walked the community, um, was raised in the community. Uh, once again, I said it earlier today, beautiful community, family-oriented community, babies, generational community, 
doctors, lawyers, MBAs, students, PhDs, engineers, McDonald's managers, Burger King managers, and everything in between. And for us to have been marginalized and stigmatized pained my heart also. The three of you have put an exclamation point on this hearing and on the testimony of all of our neighbors today. And uh, my heart is sad, but my spirit is glad because you are here to share it. And I thank you. I really want to thank you. I want to sort of echo the statements of my colleague, um, Councilmember Adams, who I know has been working tirelessly. Her and her staff have been out there to support um, every member of the community. I really want to thank her for that. Again, I don't know if I've done that enough today, but I want to make sure that I know that I, I recognize her good works. And uh, really, you know, I know we, you deserve better. And today's hearing is a very small part of that in just trying to get the answers that you absolutely deserve and looking to make sure on how we can do this better as a city that no other community suffers in the way that you have suffered and that we can try to do or get this right. Oh, oh Councilmember Levin, you know, he's back. So let me, uh, let me actually hear some questions. So let me uh, pass it over to him before I was about to close, but I will send it his way. Thank you, Chair. I just had a quick question about the Department of Health and whether they've been able to go out to your basements and do like a fecal coliform um, test and whether there's any kind of ongoing testing to make sure that you're not, you and your families are not exposed to bacteria that could be dangerous and et cetera, E. coli and that kind of stuff. So the only testing that, that we've had, um, I can't speak for everyone that, but in my personal home, the only testing I've um, had done was the, uh, the air quality test. Um, um, Besides that, there's been nothing, but um, I, I did want to add on um, something else. Yesterday, while it was raining, um, and, and I was at home um, waiting for um, we're, we're waiting for the DP to show up with, with the, the boilers, um, I did t take a look in uh, the, the front of my house, and there's like patches of, of grass of, of the, the lawn. And um, uh, not mine, per se, but um, uh, some of my neighbors, um, I, I did um, recognize that there was water, like puddles of water, like rising from the grass. So um, w with that said, my home and the rest of my neighbors, when they were, you know, trekking everything out of the homes, it's, there wasn't really um, uh, much care um, because they would have slowed, slowed the efforts. So they just wanted to get out of there. But there wasn't really much care um, uh, as, as far as like, um, what's going on 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 the streets on the mm -hmm. sidewalks and and, and and such and at first i wasn't too concerned about it because i thought oh maybe the rain will just wash it out but it, that's not what i recognized yeah. um, when it was raining yesterday is the puddles were just coming up and um you know i'm pretty sure if we test some of those some of those puddles of water, some of those patches of grass, you're going to find like fecal matter and such in it sure i would encourage uh, dep to work with DOHMH and make sure that, or uh, or uh, um, emergency management to 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 make sure that there's no residual, um, not just mold spore issues, but also you know issues r r around the sewage as well. Thank For you. myself, um, I've been told that they were going to do the air quality. I haven't seen any documentation on it. Um, I was told that it was done in my area to some of my neighbors and everything was 100%. But again, I didn't see any documentation right. on it. And he brought up another good point because when I did go on Monday night, it was raining. And when I looked in my backyard, which again, I have those photos, the water was puddling back up. Yeah. So when it seeps back down, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so I don't, I don't even know what they're testing for. Yeah, they've I would be more concerned almost with, with uh, residue rather than air quality in a sense. So they're air quality right. for mold spores, but residue isn't necessarily airborne, but could be under your tiles, for example. Right. Um, stuff like that. You just, you know, I wouldn't want that in my house either. So. Right. But then I haven't had great communication with the company that is doing the cleaning for my home because they don't tell me anything. 
they've been right. walking in and out of my basement and leaving the door unlocked and going in and out. They haven't even been requiring me to be there or letting me know, okay, hey, Ms. Taylor, this is what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, this is what we're gonna do. Someone had called me on Monday and asked me if I had done a final inspection yet. I said, final inspection? Nobody's told me about any type of inspection because I'm not staying there. So I would think that they would call me so that I could be there for that mm -hmm. or let me know at least that that's what's going to be done. And I had to tell them, I don't, so I don't know anything. Right. So I don't know what they've done, what they haven't done, what they plan on doing or when they plan on doing it because they don't call me to tell me. I mean, they should frankly, you know, make sure that, that they're doing a test or the cleanup, either the cleanup agency is doing a test or do HMH is able to go out and do testing, but somebody should be able to give you a clean bill of health that your basement is not still contaminated with sewage. That's yeah, I just have to go there. One council and that's member. how I found yeah. out. Yeah. That's, how I, that's how I find out what's being done is mm -hmm. when I go there. Nobody's calling me to tell me what they're doing or even ask my permission to do it. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, has the DEP officially taken responsibility for this? Um, I don't know the. I don't know the answer to that. Pretty much since the community meeting on Sunday, nothing has changed because, as Ms. Taylor said, and you heard the commissioner say, that they still have not determined the cause of the situation. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, again, thank you to this panel for your good testimony and all um, expressing this and all that you're going through. And, and we're doing, like I said before, a small measure of trying to make sure we get answers that you most certainly deserve. So thank you for your testimony today. And we're going to continue to work. I know the DEP is still here. And I know that the controller's office is still there as well. Um, so I want to make sure we're connecting um, you with the, you know, the, the agencies that can best help, but we are here as, I know that Councilman Adams is, is here as a resource, as am I, uh, so we're happy to assist as well. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you, thank you to all the residents who came out today um, to testify and tell their stories. Uh, so um, with, with that, I want to thank again my colleague, Councilmember Adams, for her strong leadership and uh, supporting the residents during this difficult time. Um, you know, we have a lot of answers that we need uh, we need to you know we need to find a lot more answers um, and we, we need to continue to work forward with the community to make sure we get this right and to make sure that as you said it's not just uh, tune furnaces it's it's a lot more than that so we have a lot of work to do and I look forward to doing that with you uh, I want to thank Samara Swanston I want to thank um, our, our staff attorney uh, Ricky Chawla, Nadia Johnson, Jonathan Seltzer from staff, uh, my staff as well, and of course, the amazing staff of Councilmember Adrian Adams, who's been working tirelessly um, on this since the moment it happened. Uh, and of course, the Sergeant at Arms, who always makes sure that these committee hearings run well. And with that, I will gavel this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed.